Part 2 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to the Curse of Strahd This video follows on from Part 1, where we explored the town of Barovia and the Death House Dungeon. In this portion of the guide, we'll be looking at several important locations of Barovia and points of note along the Old Salovich Road. I'll also be refreshing your memory on the role of Strahd in this adventure and offer some guide on how to best present him to the players. A small aside with travel. Using the 5th edition rules for overland travel and the quarter mile grid listed on this map, players moving at a normal pace and sticking to the roads should be able to walk from Barovia to Krezek in about 2 days. You may want to halve or quarter their move speed if they attempt to move through the thick labyrinthine forests or attempt to climb the mountains, which of course would have their own dangerous monsters and snares. This speed of travel will be important to keep in mind and will be influenced by what the players have available to them, such as riding mounts or travelling magic. But be aware that Barovia is not a normal place, and often breaks rules regarding time, space and direction. Perhaps it's the workings of Strahd himself, or the dark powers that crafted the world, or other forces looking to lure the players in a certain direction. Remember that this map is intended for the Dungeon Master to understand the layout of Barovia, and not necessarily something the players should have available to them. After all, things are far more frightening when they are part of the unknown. Area A – The Old Salovich Road To describe the road as safe is misleading but at least it's free from tree roots and painful jagged rocks, the occasional pool of muddy stagnant water will soil travellers' clothes as they walk across it. Black pools of water stand like dark mirrors, and in and around the muddy roadway, giant trees loom on both sides, their branches clawing at the mist. Area B – The Gates of Barovia Two sets of these gates exist, one on the west of the village of Barovia, and one to the east of the village. The fog spills out of the forest to swallow up the road behind you. Ahead, jutting out from an impenetrable wood on both sides of the road, are huge stone buttresses looming in the grey fog. Huge iron gates hang on the stonework. Dew clings with a cold tenacity to the rusted bars. Two headless statues of armed guardians flank the gate. Their heads are now lying among the weeds at their feet. They greet you only with silence. As the characters approach, the gates swing open on screeching hinges. The gates close behind the characters after they pass through. If the players are with any Vistani, the gate opens for them. However, it does little to help them when they try to move through the magical fog as described in part 1. Area C – Salovich Woods Towering trees whose tops are lost in a heavy grey mist block out all but a deathly grey light. The tree trunks are unnaturally close to one another, and the woods have the silence of a forgotten grave, yet they exude the feeling of an unvoiced scream. Whichever player in the party has the best wisdom score, or the best sense of smell, notices this. You catch the scent of death in the air. The characters can follow the stench to its source quite easily. The foul stench leads you to a human corpse half buried in the underbrush about 15 feet from the road. The young man appears to be a commoner. His muddy clothes are torn and raked with claw marks. Crows have been at the body, which is now surrounded by paw prints. The man has obviously been dead for several days. He holds a crumpled envelope in one hand. The dead man, Dalvin Olensky, was trying to escape from Barovia with the letter from his master when he was killed on the road by Strahd's dire wolves. Wanting to return at once to Strahd, the wolves left the body in the woods and have not yet returned to feast. The letter on Dalavan's hand has a large B set into the wax seal. Parchment is worn and flimsy. If the characters open and read the letter, 
showed them the Kalan Indurovich's letter, version 2. Hail to thee of might and valour. I, the burgomaster of Barovia, send you honour. With despair. My adopted daughter, the fair Irina Kolyana, has been these past nights bitten by a vampire. For over 400 years this creature has drained the lifeblood of my people. Now my dear Irina languishes and dies from an unholy wound caused by this vile beast. He has become too powerful to conquer. So I say to you, give us up for dead, and encircle this land with symbols of good. Let holy men call upon their power that the devil may be contained within these walls of weeping Barovia. Leave our sorrows to our grave, and save the world from this evil fate of ours. There is much wealth entrapped in this community, Return for your reward after we are all departed for a better life. Kolyan Indurovich, Burgomaster. The letter is dated to one week ago. Dalvam was instructed to place the letter at the gates in hopes that visitors would find it and turn back. If the characters linger in the woods, they hear a lone wolf howl far off in the forest. Each round, one more wolf gets added to its voice in the howling and the sound gets progressively closer to the party. If the characters are still in the woods after about five rounds, five dire wolves arrive and attack. As long as players flee this encounter, the dire wolves do not pursue them, and instead enjoy eating the remains of Dalvin. Should the players return here later and attempt to leave through the gates, these dire wolves, along with twenty normal wolves, will stalk them at the gate and attack them when they find an opportune moment. Area D, River Ivelis. When the characters come within sight of this river, read, This river flows as clear as a blue winter sky through the valley. The river is roughly 50 feet wide, and has depths varying from 5 to 10 feet. There are arching stone bridges that span the river at two different points one near the village of Barovia, and the other near Sir Falls. Area E is the village of Barovia. This village is described in part one of this guide. Area F, the River Ivalis Crossroads. The first time the characters arrive here, you should roll on the random encounter table, unless they are accompanied by the Vistani. An old wooden gallow creaks in the chill wind that blows from the high ground to the west. A frayed length of rope dances from its beam. The well-worn road splits here, and a signpost opposite the gallows points off in three directions. Barovia village to the east, Sir Pools to the northwest, and Ravenloft and Valakai to the southwest. The northwest fork slants down and disappears into the trees, while the southwest fork clings to an upward slope. Across from the gallows, a low wall crumbling in places partially encloses a small plot of graves that's shrouded in fog. The northwest forks leads down a river to area G, and the road southwest leads to area H. The east road leads to an arching stone bridge and continues on to the village of Barovia in area E. If the characters are travelling with the Vistani, the Vistani lead them along the northwest road to the Vistani encampment. Now, as a note to Dungeon Masters, if you're looking to have your players have the fortunes of Ravenloft revealed to them here, it is probably best to send them to this location first. Perhaps describe the road as being more favourable or that there's an inviting glow of a campfire smoke coming from the north. Regardless, I highly recommend sending your players here first as they begin their adventure in the Curse of Strahd. The gallows here cause an unnerving haunt. Have all the players roll a wisdom save. All the players now notice a body hanging from the once empty gallows. A cold wind blows, and the body slowly twists to face them. The character with the lowest result on the wisdom save sees themselves hanging dead from the gallows. The other characters just see a nameless Barovian. If the players interact or attempt to cut down the body, it melts away into mist and nothingness. If any of the characters had a card reading 
the seven of coins, the thief. Then the players find one treasure if they dig up the graves. Most of the graves here, however, simply contain rotting bones. Area G, the Sir Pool Encampment. The road gradually disappears and is replaced by a twisted muddy path through the trees. Deep ruts in the earth are evidence of the comings and goings of wagons. The canopy of mist and branches suddenly gives way to black clouds boiling far above. There is a clearing here, next to the river that widens to form a small lake several hundred feet across. Five colourful round tents, each ten feet in diameter, are pitched outside a ring of four-barrel topped wagons. A much larger tent stands at the shore of the lake. Its sagging form is lit from within. Near this tent, eight unbridled horses drink from the river. The mournful strains of an accordion clash with the singing of several brightly clad figures around a bonfire. A footpath continues beyond this encampment, meandering north between the river and the forest sedge. There are eight draft horses drinking from the river that are used to pull the Vistani wagons, and they aren't easily startled. If the characters are brought to this camp by other Vistani, their escorts remain at the camp and don't accompany the adventuring party any further. Twelve Vistani, chaotic neutral male and female human bandits, are standing and sitting around the fire, telling stories and guzzling wine. They are intoxicated and have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Chaotic neutral male and female human bandit captains are resting on three of the four wagons, but leap quickly into action if the alarm is raised. Although the Vistani in this camp are in league with Strad, they attack only if the characters provoke them with threats or insults. Otherwise, the characters are offered flasks of wine and are invited to join in the reverie. If the characters linger in the camp, they'll be told of Vistana's tale. If they seem in a hurry to leave, one of the Vistani tells them, It was fate that would bring you to our humble camp. Madame Ava foretold your coming. She awaits you. The Vistana then points to the largest tent. If the characters head that way, they can have their fortunes read by Madame Eva. A Vistana's Tale A mighty wizard came to this land over a year ago. I remember him like it was yesterday. He stood exactly like you were standing. A very charismatic man he was. He thought he could rally the people of Barovia against the Devil Strahd. He stirred them with the thoughts of revolt, and bore them into the castle en masse. When the vampire appeared, the wizard's peasant army fled in terror. A few stood their ground, and they were never seen again. The wizard and the vampire cast spells at each other. Their battle flew from over the courtyards of Ravenloft to a precipice overlooking the falls. I saw the battle with my own eyes. Thunder shook the mountainside and great rocks tumbled down upon the wizard. Yet by his magic he survived. Lightning from the heavens struck the wizard, and again he stood his ground. But the devil stride fell upon him. The wizard's magic couldn't save him. I remember him throwing a thousand feet to his death. I climbed down to the river to search for the wizard's body, to see, you know, if he had anything valuable. But the river Ivalus had spirited him away somewhere. The Vistana storyteller doesn't remember the wizard's name, but recalls that it sounded important. If the characters haven't spoken to Madame Ava yet, the storyteller urges them to do so. Madame Ava's Tent Magic flames cast a reddish glow over the interior of this tent, revealing a low table covered in a black velvet cloth. Glints of light seem to flash from a crystal ball on the table as a hunched figure peers into its depths. As the crone speaks, her voice crackles like dry weeds. At last, you have arrived. Cackling laughter bursts like mad lightning from her withered lips. Madame Ava speaks the name of each party member without needing introduction. She even makes references to the character's individual past. She then asks the characters if they want their fortunes read. If they say yes, Madame Ava produces a worn deck of cards and proceeds to give them their fate, as described in part one of this Dungeon Master's Guide. Madame Eva may seem mad, 
but she is in fact cunning and sharp of mind. She has met a good many adventurers in her time, and she knows that they can't be fully trusted. She wants to free the land of Barovia from this curse, and her fate is interwoven with Strahd's. Madame Ava is in fact the half-sister of Strahd von Zarovich. Although she appears to be about 70 years old, she is in fact much older. Strahd is unaware of this fact. Her real name is Katerina, and she is the daughter of a Vistani woman whom King Barov, Strahd's father, took to his bed during one of his many crusades. Madame Eva knows that she is Strahd's half-sister, but has told no one of the royal blood flowing through her veins. Over 400 years ago, Katerina came to Barovia and insinuated herself into Strahd's court, working as a maid in Castle Ravenloft. She came to know the castle like the back of her hand, and she was present at the wedding of Sergei and Tatiana. After Strahd went mad and murdered his brother, she fled the castle and took refuge with the Vistani. Later she forged a pact with the Mother Goddess of Night, trading her youth for power to undo the evil that Strahd had wrought. Mother Night transformed Katerina into an ageless crone and gifted her the power of magical foresight. In the guise of Madame Ava, she uses this ability to help Strahd. She can send her Vistani out in their wagons to visit other worlds and bring adventurers to Strahd's domain in hopes that they will find a way to destroy the vampire or set Strahd free. The dark powers of Ravenloft would consider Madame Ava a worthy choice to replace Strahd as the master of Ravenloft, but she has all the power she desires and doesn't seek to supplant him. She would rather help Strahd find someone else to succeed him, although she has grave doubts about her ability to locate such an individual. None of Madame Eva's Vistani kin know her true identity or purpose. They all puzzle over her desire to remain in Barovia. She does the vampire's bidding when called upon, and does nothing to anger Strahd or bring harm to the Vistani. She never gives aid, and she never asks for any. Keep in mind that as a dungeon master, Madame Ava is a powerful spellcaster. She even has access to Ray's dead, allowing her to bring back to life one of the player characters should they die. Although she'll never give this away so frivolously, but you may want to offer her help to players who are in dire needs. If the players attempt to sneak around and steal from the Vistani, or who slay any Vistani without incurring the wrath of Madame Eva, the players can find the following in addition to the typical gear they may be carrying. A sack of a hundred Electrum pieces stamped with Strahd's visage in profile. A pouch containing four D6 gemstones worth a hundred gold pieces each. A sack containing three D6 pieces of cheap jewellery worth 25 gold piece in total, and 1d6 pieces of fine jewellery, worth 250 gold pieces each, or one magic item from the Dungeon Master's Guide. If the characters had a fortune of Ravenloft, the Two of Stars, the Diviner, then the treasure can be found in one of the Vistani wagons. In fact, Madame Ava says, I think the treasure is under my very nose. She allows the players to search the wagons freely to find their treasure. Area H, Sir Falls. If the characters reach Area H by following the footpath from the Vistani encampment, they get the following. You follow the river to the base of a canyon, at the far end which a great waterfall spills into a pool, billowing forth clouds of cold mist. A great stone bridge spans the canyon nearly 1,000 feet overhead. If the characters are on the high road instead, they get the following. You follow the dirt road as it clings to the side of the mountain. It ends before an arching bridge of mold-encrusted stone that spans a natural chasm. Gargoyles are cloaked in black moss that perch on the corners of these bridges. Their frowns are weather-worn. On the mountainous side of the bridge, a waterfall spills into a misty pool nearly a thousand feet below. The pool feeds a river that meanders into the fog-shrouded pines that blanket the valley. 
The chasm's walls are slippery and sheer, and can't be scaled without the aid of magic or a climber's kit. The bridge is slick with moisture, but is safe to cross. The road south of the bridge leads down the mountainside to Area F. The road to the north cuts through the mountain to Area I. The gargoyles on the bridge are harmless sculptures. Area I. The Black Carriage. Even here, in the mountains, the forest and the fog are inescapable. Ahead, the dirt road splits into two, widening towards the east where you see a patch of cobblestone suggesting that the eastern branch was once an important thoroughfare. If Strahd has invited the characters to Castle Ravenloft, or otherwise wants to steer them in his direction, add, Parked at the fork in the road, pointed east, is a large black carriage drawn by two black horses. The horses snort puffs of steamy breath into the chill mountain air. The side door of the carriage swings open silently. The two black draft horses are under Strahd's control. The horses wait for the characters to pile into the carriage if they so desire. There is room inside for eight of them. If they get into the carriage, the horse draws them down to the road in Area J. The horses can't be discouraged from their course, not even by a skilled teamster. Characters who don't want to travel east in the carriage can follow the road northwest through a set of iron gates in Area B that open up as they approach and close behind them. Or characters can travel south along the winding road to the bridge at Sir Falls in Area H. Area J, the Gates of Ravenloft. This description assumes that they arrived in the carriage from Area I. After winding through the forest and craggy mountain peaks, the road suddenly turns to the east and there is the startling and awesome presence of Castle Ravenloft. The carriage comes to a dead stop before twin turrets of stone, broken from years of exposure. Beyond these guard towers is the precipice of a 50-foot wide fog-filled chasm that disappears into unknown depths. A lowered drawbridge of old shored-up wooden beams stretches across the chasm between you and the archway to the courtyard. The chains of the drawbridge creak in the wind, and its rust-eaten iron strains under the weight. From atop the high walls, stone gargoyles stare at you with their hollowed eye sockets and grin hideously. A rotten wooden portcullis, green with growth, hangs above the entry tunnel. Beyond this location is the main door to Ravenloft, and it stands open. A rich, warm light spills from within flooding the courtyard. Torches flutter sadly in sconces on both sides of the open doors. It is important to note, if your players choose to go to Castle Ravenloft before reaching at least 7th level, or without having the important magical items as described in the Fates of Barovia, or without having gathered any allies to help them, they will most likely die due to the powerful creatures and traps that are found within. That said, the goal of you as Dungeon Master, and Strahd himself, is not to outright kill the player characters simply for treading on dangerous ground. Make it known to them that their task is currently beyond their power, but let them take a peek at what they'll be up against in the future. The drawbridge appears sturdy, but a few bits of its borders are missing, and it creaks and groans under any weight. For every creature that attempts to cross this bridge, other than Strahd himself, or creatures under his direct control, there is a 5% chance that one of its boards will break under the creature. If a board breaks, the creature must succeed on a DC-10 dexterity saving throw, or fall to the bottom of the cliffs, 1,000 feet below. If a companion is within 5 feet of the creature, and reaches out to grab it, the creature has advantage on the save. There is a patch of green slime, which is listed as a dungeon hazard in the Dungeon Master's Guide, but you can also use a grey ooze for the purpose of the stat block. It clings to the entry of the Portocullis entry tunnel. It can be spotted with a successful DC-20 perception check, but the slime does not fall on any characters first entering the castle. It does, however, fall on the first character who tries to leave by this route. Area K 
Castle Ravenloft. This castle is a massive dungeon with multiple levels and many creatures that live within, as well as being the backdrop to the end of most adventurers in the Curse of Strahd, be it one way or another. The Castle Ravenloft will feature entirely in the final video of this Dungeon Master's Guide. Area L, Lake Sarovich. At the foot of the mountains, nestled in a misty forest, is a large lake. The water is perfectly still and dark, reflecting the black clouds overhead like a monstrous mirror. If the characters arrive along the shore north of Valakai in the daytime, add, pulled up along the south shore are three small rowboats. A fourth boat can be seen in the middle of the lake, with a lone figure sitting in it, a fishing pole in hand. Each rowboat can safely hold five people. The person fishing on the lake is Bluto Krogorov, neutral evil male human commoner, a resident of Valakai. He's in a trance and doesn't respond to anything or anyone unless attacked. His boat is 400 feet from the nearest shore. Tied up in the boat is a seven-year-old Vistana named Arabelle, a lawful neutral female human commoner with two hit points and no effective attacks. She is bound with hempen rope and wrapped in a burlap sack, lying prone so that she can't be seen or heard from the shore. Role-playing Bluto Bluto Krogorov is a destitute drunkard. He's desperate to catch some fish and trade them for wine at the Blue Water Inn. After he was unable to catch a single fish for a week, he kidnapped Arabelle, believing that the Vistani are lucky. He intends to sacrifice her to the lake, hoping it will give some of its fish in return. If the characters watch Bluto from the shore for several minutes, or if they row out into the lake to greet him, he tosses the burlap sack into the water and watches it sink, and waits with the fishing pole in hand for his reward. Bluto is a hollow shell of a man, barely able to understand his own actions. He is unarmed and does nothing to aid or thwart the characters. Role-playing Arabelle Characters who act quickly can save Arabelle before she drowns. A character on the shore must succeed on a DC 15 strength athletics check to reach her in time. The DC is 10 for characters who took a rowboat out onto the lake. Arabelle has alabaster white skin and raven black hair. If rescued, she demands to be returned to her family's camp outside Valakai in Chapter 5 of Area N9. She is certain that her father, Luvash, will give the characters a reward for doing so. A descendant of Madame Ava, with the blood of Barovian royalty in her veins, Arabelle is unaware of her connection to Strahd. She acts more like an adult than a child. Despite her recent misadventure, she believes a great destiny awaits her. Area M the Mad Mage of Mount Baratok. This encounter can occur anywhere along the base of Mount Baratok. North of the mountain lake, the trees begin their steady climb up the slopes of Mount Baratok, its monolithic presence oppressive at this distance. The ground here is rocky, uneven, and tiring to navigate. Even the wolves avoid this neck of the woods. Soon you climb above the blanket of fog that engulfs the valley. Dark thunderclouds roll overhead. You see an elk standing on a rocky spur about 60 feet away. Suddenly, it assumes the form of a man in tattered black robes. His hair and beard are long, black, and streaked with grey, and his eyes crackle with an eldritch power. The Mad Mage of Mount Baratok, a chaotic neutral male human archmage, came to Barovia more than a year ago to free its people from Strahd's tyranny but he underestimated Strahd's hold over the land and the creatures in it. After a battle between the two in Castle Ravenloft, Strahd drove the Mad Mage to the mountains and sent the wizard hurling over Sierra Falls in Area H. The wizard, his staff, and spellbook lost, survived the fall and retreated into the mountains, hoping to regain his power, only to be driven mad by the realization that he no longer has any hope of defeating Strahd or freeing the people of the vampire's damned realm. The Mad Mage has forgotten his name and the world whence he came. In fact, 
He doesn't remember anything about what happened before the madness. He suffers from paranoia and that powerful enemies are hunting him and that the evil agents are everywhere and watching him. Believing that the characters aim to kill him, the mad mage unleashes his destructive magic. As he tears into them, he shouts, You think my magic has grown weak? Think again! If he is reduced to 50 hit points or fewer, he shouts, Tell your dark masters they can break my body, but never my spirit! He then tries to escape. Under normal circumstances, a greater restoration spell cast on the mad mage would restore his wits and end the madness, allowing him to remember that he is none other than Mordenkainen, an archmage of Oeth, and the leader of a powerful group of adventurers called the Circle of Eight. But in this case, the mad mage has cast a mind blank spell on himself. As long as the spell remains in effect, his sanity can't be restored by any spell. If the characters surmise that a powerful magic is preventing them from restoring the Mad Mage's wits, they can, with a successful DC 15 Charisma Persuasion check, convince the Mad Mage to divulge the reason why their spell failed. A character can also ascertain the cause of the spell's failure, with a successful DC 18 Intelligence Arcana check. The Mad Mage's Mind Blank spell has a remaining duration of 3d6 hours after which his madness can be cured normally. The Mad Mage has a different spell list from that of the Archmage in the Monster Manual. He has already used one first level spell slot to cast Mage Armor on himself, one fourth level spell slot to cast Polymorph on himself, one seventh level spell slot to cast Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion, and one eighth level spell slot to cast Mind Blank on himself. His cantrips are Firebolt, Light, Mage Hand, Prestigitation, and Shocking Grasp. His first level spells are Detect Magic, Mage Armor, Magic Missile, and Shield. His second level spells are Mirror Image, Misty Step, and Web. His third level spells are Counterspell, Fly, and Lightning Bolt. His fourth level spells are Mordekainen's Faithful Hound, Polymorph, and Stone Skin. His fifth level spells are Bigby's Hand, Cone of Cold, and Scrying. His 6th level spell is True Seeing. His 7th level spell is Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion. His 8th level spell is Mind Blank. And his 9th level spell is Time Stop. If the characters rescue the Archmage from his madness, he invites them into his mansion. He leads them up a mountain to an invisible doorway that serves as the entrance to his extra-dimensional lair, created using the Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion spell. There, he provides them with food and sanctuary, away from the prying eyes of Strahd and his spies. Characters are free to take a short or long rest, during which time they aren't disturbed. Mordenkainen is familiar with the worlds beyond his own. For example, if the characters come from the Forgotten Realms and mention this fact to Mordenkainen, he asks them if they know his old friend Elminster of Shadowdale. If Mordenkainen isn't the party's ally as foretold in Madame Eva's card readings, he declines to join them if asked. With his wits restored, he sets out to find his missing staff and spellbook, leaving the characters on their own. He doesn't allow them to help him, for he fears that they may be tempted to steal either his staff or his spellbook. Being an adventurer himself, he knows how the lure of powerful magic can bring out the worst in adventurers. Before he leaves as a parting gift, the Archmage imbues each character with a charm of heroism. You can find what this supernatural gift is in Chapter 7 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. If your card reading reveals that the Mad Mage is the party's ally in a battle against Strahd, Mordenkainen can be persuaded to help them once his sanity is restored. He won't join them on their travels, but he will help them fight Strahd if they have discovered where to find the vampire and how to destroy him. With his sanity restored, Mordenkainen can be stubborn and even difficult with his friends, and he doesn't suffer fools. He normally spends more time listening than talking, but when he does speak, his pronouncements are authoritative and not to be questioned. The Archmage has never had his fortune read by Madame Eva, and he doesn't care to, but if he is told about the holy symbol of Ravenkind, the Tome of Strahd, and the Sun Sword, he insists that these items be recovered before he and the party confront Strahd. If Strahd is defeated and Mordekainen survives, 
The Archmage gladly accompanies the characters back to their world if they invite him, if only not to disappoint them. Area P. Lunar River Crossroads. Try to always check for a random encounter when the characters reach these crossroads. The road comes to an X intersection which branches to the northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast. The lower half of a snapped wooden signpost thrusts upwards at an angle near the eastern elbow of the intersection. The top half of the sign, featuring arms pointing in four directions, lies in the weeds nearby. The characters can easily figure out how to join the top half of the signpost that connects to the lower half. When the two parts of the sign are aligned and rejoined, the arms indicate Krezek and Toslenka Pass to the southwest, Lake Baratok to the northwest, Valakai and Ravenloft to the northeast, and Berez to the southeast. The old Salovich Road, which runs northeast to southwest between Valakai, area N, and Krezek, area S, is generally level. About a quarter mile along the northeast branch, an arching stone bridge crosses the Lunar River. The northwest branch of the crossroads climbs gently, becoming a dirt trail through the woods within half a mile. It merges with the old Salovich Road again after a couple of miles, but not before sprouting a branch that leads to Van Richten's Tower on Lake Baratok, area V. The southeast branch wends gently downward as it follows the river into the valley. This trail eventually ends at the most abandoned riverside burg of Berez in Area U. Area R. Raven River Crossroads. Try to add a random encounter whenever the characters enter this crossroad. This stretch of the old Salovich Road has multiple branches. One branch heads north, quickly turning into a dirt path that leads to Van Richten's Tower on Lake Baratok in Area V. One branch heads south, becoming Salenka Pass in Area T. As it winds through the lower mountains and clings to the side of Mount Gacchus, a third branch heads west towards the Wizard of Wines winery and vineyard in Area W, dipping south as it changes from a road into a gravel trail. Standing at the intersection of Old Salovich Road and the road to the winery is a signpost. You see a weather-worn signpost next to the road. The three arms of the signpost point along the three branches of the road. The arm pointing to the north reads Krezek, and through the woods you can see an arching stone bridge spanning a river. The arm pointing east reads Valakai, and the road slopes up gradually in that direction. The arm pointing southwest reads The Wizard of Wines. The road slopes gently downwards in that direction. These other areas from within Barovia will appear in later videos. The Wizard of Wines, Van Richten's Tower, Old Bone Grinder, The Amber Temple, Argenvostholt, The Village of Krezek, Yester Hill, The Werewolf Den, Toslenka Pass, The Ruins of Berez, and finally Castle Ravenloft. Chapter 5. The Town of Valakai Located close to the shores of Lake Zarevich, the town of Valakai seems like a safe haven against the evils of the Salovich woods, if not Strahd himself. The town lies beyond the site of Castle Ravenloft and doesn't, at first blush, seem to be as depressed or oppressed as the village of Barovia's farther east. Characters who spend their time in Valakai, however, quickly realize that there is no happiness here, only false hope, which Strahd himself cultivates. Valakai was found not long after Strahd's armies conquered the valley by an ancestor of the town's current burgomaster, Baron Vargas Valakovich. The Valakoviches have royal blood in their veins and have long believed themselves superior to the Zorovich line. Baron Vakolovich has deluded himself into believing that hope and happiness are the keys to Valakai's salvation. 
If he can make everyone in Valakai happy, the Burgomaster thinks the town will somehow escape Strahd's grasp and return to the forgotten world whence it came. He stages one festival after another to bolster the spirits of the townsfolk. But most Valakins consider these festivals to be pointless, meaningless affairs, more likely to incur Strahd's wrath than provide any hope for the future. In the last festival, Baron Valakovich had townsfolk parade through the streets with severed heads of wolves on pikes. The next event, which the Burgomaster has dubbed the Festival of the Blazing Sun, is soon to get underway. The weather-worn garlands from the previous festival still hang from the eaves of Valakai's buildings, and work has begun on a large wicker sun to be set ablaze in the town square on the day of the festival. In the days leading up to the festival, Baron Valakovich has begun arresting local malcontents and throwing them in the stock so that his efforts aren't ruined by those of little hope or faith. When the characters first approach Valakai, read, The old Salovich road meanders into a valley, watched over by dark brooding mountains to the north and south. The wood recedes, revealing a sullen mountain berg surrounded by a wooden palisade, Thick fog presses up against the walls, as though looking for a way inside, hoping to catch the town a slumber. The dirt road ends at a set of sturdy iron gates, with a pair of shadowy figures standing behind them. Planted in the ground and flanking the road outside the gates are half a dozen pikes with wolves' heads impaled on them. A fifteen-foot-high wall encloses the town, its vertical logs are held together with thick rope and mortar. The top of each log has been sharpened to a point. The wooden scaffolding hugs the inside of the palisade 12 feet off the ground, enabling guards to peer over the wall there. Three tall gates made of iron bars lead into the town. The north gate is sometimes called the Zarovich Gate, or the Gate to the Lake, because it leads to Lake Zarovich in Area L. The West Gate is referred to as the Sunset Gate, even though no living person in Valakai has seen an undimmed sunset. A few abandoned cottages line the road outside this gate. The East Gate is known as the Morning Gate, or as some locals like to call it, the Morning Gate. Heavy iron chains with iron padlocks keep the gate shut at night. During the day the gates are closed but not typically locked. Two town guards, lawful good male or female humans, stand on the inside of each gate. Instead of spears, they carry pikes, with a 10-foot reach dealing 1d10 plus 1 piercing damage on a hit. These weapons are long enough to stab creatures through the bars of the gate. The guards greet all visitors with suspicion, particularly those that arrive at night. One or more of them must succeed on a DC-20 charisma persuasion check, to convince the guards to unlock the gate and let them enter. If trouble breaks out, one of the guards then cries, Two arms! Their shout echoes across Valakai, putting the entire town on alert within a few minutes. Valakai has 24 human guards, half of whom are on duty at any given time. Six usually stand watch at the gates and six patrol the walls. The town can also muster a militia of 50 able-bodied human commoners armed with clubs, daggers, and torches. If the characters explore a residence other than the Burgomaster's mansion in Area N3, you can roll a d20 and consult the following table to determine the house's occupant. On a 1 to 3, the houses are empty. On a 4 to 5, there is 2d4 swarms of rats. On a 6 to 18, there are Valakian townfolk. On a 19 to 20, there are Valakian cultists. A house infested with rats appears to be abandoned at first. The rats, however, are servants of Strahd, and they attack the characters if they attempt to explore the interiors of the house. A house of Valakian townsfolk contain 1d4 adults, lawful good male and female human commoners, and 1d8-1 children, who are also lawful good male and female human non-combatants. Anyone who listens at the door can hear chatter from within. Townsfolk won't willingly invite strangers into their homes, but they will speak with characters from behind closed doors or while standing on their vestibules. 
a cult house will haven 2d4 Valakian adults, lawful evil male and female cultists, and one cult fanatic, a lawful evil male or female, who leads them in prayer and orchestrates ritual sacrifices. These cultists worship devils and consider Lady Fiona Watcher in Area N4 to be their spiritual leader. In addition to the information known by all Borovians, Valakians know the following bits of additional local lore. The Blue Water Inn in Area N2 offers food and wine and shelter to visitors. A stranger with pointed ears is staying there. He came to Barovia from a distant land, riding into town on a carnival wagon. The Burgomaster, Baron Vargas Valakovich, has decreed that the Festival of the Blazing Sun will be held in the town square of Area N8 in three days. The previous festival, which he called the Wolf's Head Jamboree, was less than a week ago. Valakar has endured at least one festival every week for the past several years. Some Valakians believe that the festivals keep the Devil Strad at bay. Others think they provide no protection or benefit whatsoever. Most consider them dismal affairs. Those who speak ill of the festivals are declared by the Burgomaster to be in league with the Devil Strad and are arrested. Some are thrown into stocks in Area N8, while others are taken to the Burgomaster's mansion so that the Baron can purge them of their evil. The Burgomaster's henchman, Izek Strasny, has a history of violence as well as a fiendish deformity, a monstrous arm with which he can conjure fire. Fear of Izek keeps the Baron's enemies at bay. No one hates the Burgomaster more than Lady Fiona Watcher, who is often quoted as saying, I'd rather serve the devil than a madman. She owns an old house in town in Area N4, but rarely leaves her estate. Her two older sons, Nikolai and Karl, are troublemakers. Lady Watcher also has a mad daughter whom she keeps locked away. The Burgomaster doesn't confront Fiona or her offspring because he's afraid of Lady Watcher, whose family has old ties to Strad. Purple flashes of light have been seen emanating from an attic in the Burgomaster's mansion. Wolves and dire wolves prowl the woods and aren't afraid to attack travellers on the old Sulevich Road. Well-armed groups of hunters and trappers have managed to kill several wolves, but more keep coming. It's too dangerous to go out fishing on Lake Zarovich, in Area L. But the threat of Strahd's wolves hasn't stopped Bluto Kragnov, the town drunk from trying. He sets out each morning and returns every evening, but he hasn't caught any fish in a while. There have been no recent sightings of the mad mage of the Mount Baratok, in Area M. Folks used to see him skulking along the north shore of Lake Zarovich, shooting lightning bolts into the water to kill the fish. If the characters seem interested in meeting this wizard, the locals recommend that they use fishing boats on the south shore to cross the lake because it's shorter and a lot less dangerous than walking around the lake. There is a Vistani camp in the woods southwest of the town in Area N9. The Vistani there aren't very friendly. The Vistani aren't welcome into Valakai. West of town is a haunted mansion. Legend says that a dragon died there long ago. This mansion is Argen Vossalt. South of the town is a village that has been abandoned for decades. Its burgomaster committed some terrible offence and occurred the wrath of Strad. The following areas correspond to the labels of the map on Valakai. Area N1 St. Andrew's Church no map of the church is provided, but if one becomes necessary, assume this church has the same configuration of that in village Barovia, but without the undercroft. This slouching, centuries-old stone church has a bulging steeple at the back and its walls are lined with cracks. Stained glass windows depict pious saints. A fence of wrought iron encloses the garden of gravestones next to the church. A thin mist creeps among the graves. This church is dedicated to the Morning Lord and named after St. Andrew, whose bones once rested under the altar. Father Lucian Perovich, a lawful good male human priest, 
oversees the church and does his best to raise spirits. Assisting him is an orphan and an altar boy named Yeska, a lawful good male human non-combatant. A brawny lad with a perpetually furrowed brow, Milivoj, tends the grounds and digs graves. At night, the church is packed with 2d6 plus 6 frightened Valakirian adults, lawful good male and female human commoners, and 2d6 equally terrified Valkyrian children, lawful good male and female human non-combatants. Father Lucian offers his nightly congregation his prayers and the promise of St. Andrew's protection. Among Father Lucian's nightly flock is a sad old woman named Wilhelmina Rakolva. Her son, a shoemaker, Udo Lokovic, has been imprisoned for speaking out against the Burgomaster. See area N3M. She prays that her son will be set free. Milovoj, a neutral male human commoner, is rarely seen without a shovel, which he wields like a club. In addition to his commoner stat block, he has a strength of 15, and his melee weapon has a bonus of plus 4, which he uses to deal 1d4 plus 2 bludgeoning damage when he hits a creature with the blunt head of his shovel. Milijov rejects the Burgomaster's proclamations that all will be well, and is frustrated that he can't protect his younger siblings. He wants to be free of Barovia's curse, but sees no hope of escape. The Bones of St. Andrew Until recently, the church was protected from Strahd's depredations by the Bones of St. Andrew, which were sealed in a crypt beneath the church's main altar. But now the church is at risk because someone broke into the crypt a few days ago and stole the bones. Until recently, Father Lucian was the only person in Valakai who knew about the bones, but he recalls mentioning them to Yeska over a month ago to put a fearful boy at ease. After the bones were stolen, Father Lucian asked Yeska if he told anyone else about the bones. The boy nodded, but wouldn't divulge a name. The culprit is Milovoj, whom Father Lucian correctly suspects, but the priest has been reluctant to confront Milovoj because the lad is so temperamental. Father Lucian has not reported the thief for fear of the distress the news might cause and he doesn't want to ruin the Burgomaster's festival. If the party includes a good aligned cleric or paladin, Father Lucian mentions the theft to them in hope that the characters can provide some assistance. The St. Andrew's Crypt is a 10 foot square, 5 foot high chamber beneath the chapel. To reach the crypt, Milovoj used his shovel to pry up the chapel's floorboards. The boards have since been replaced. If one of the characters confronts Milovoj, and succeeds on a DC-10 Charisma Intimidation check, he admits that Yeska told him about the bones. He also admits to passing along the information to Henrik van der Voort, the local coffin maker in Area N6, and trying to steal the bones for Henrik to return for money to help feed his younger sisters and brothers. The theft of the bones has left the church vulnerable to the attack of Strahd's minions, as described later in St. Andrew's Feast, if the bones are returned to their resting place, St. Andrew's Church once again becomes hallowed ground. Treat the building as if it was protected by a hallow spell. Area N2 The Blue Water Inn Grey smoke issues from the chimney of this large two-story wooden building with a stone foundation and sagging tile roof, upon which several ragemans have perched. A painted wooded sign hangs above the main entrance that depicts a blue waterfall. The Blue Water Inn is Valakai's main gathering place for locals, especially at night. The innkeeper, Erwin Martikov, considers the inn a sanctuary from the evils of this land. In the event of trouble, the windows and doors can all be barred shut from within. A bed for the night costs one electrum piece. The characters looking for something to eat are fed a hot beet soup and fresh bread with no additional charge. A cooked wolf steak costs one electrum piece. The inn offers a pint of purple grape marsh number three wine for three copper pieces, or a pint of the superior red dragon crushed wine for one silver piece. Erwin is hurt if the characters complain about the wines, for his family makes them. The inn's wine supply is almost depleted, and the latest delivery from the Wizard of Wines winery is overdue. If the characters claim to be adventurers, 
Erwin asks them if they would be so kind as to find what's holding up the later shipment and promises them free room and board if they return with the wine. Keepers of the Feather Erwin Martikov, a lawful good male human, is a were-raven, a high-ranking member of the Keepers of the Feather, a secret society of were-ravens that oppose Strad. Erwin's wife and business partner, Danica Dorakova, a lawful good female human, is also a were-raven, as are their two sons, Brom and Bray. The boys only have seven hit points each, and at ages 11 and 9 are too young to be effective combatants. At any time, another 1d4 were-ravens, members of the Keepers of the Feather, are present at the inn. Either they are perched on the rooftop in raven form, or huddle inside in human form. These were-ravens are loyal friends of the Martikovs, and help protect the inn. If the characters earn the trust of the were-ravens of Alakai, the Keepers of the Feather will watch their backs. The next time the characters get themselves in serious trouble, you can have 1d4 were-ravens show up to rescue or otherwise help them. Were-ravens are secretive and extraordinarily curious lycanthropes that trust one another but are wary of just about everyone else. Although skilled at blending into society, they keep mostly to themselves, respect local laws, and strive to do good wherever possible. In their human and hybrid forms, were-ravens favour light weapons. They are reluctant to make bite attacks in raven form for fear of spreading their curse to those who don't deserve it, or who would abuse it. Were-ravens refer to their tightly knit groups as kindnesses. The kindness of were-ravens usually numbers between 7 and 12 individuals. Not surprisingly, were-ravens get along well with ravens and often hide in plain sight among them. Were-ravens like to collect shiny trinkets and precious baubles. They are fond of sharing their wealth with those in need, and in humanoid form, modestly give money to charity. They take step in keeping magic items out of evil hands by stashing them in secret hiding places. The Monster Manual has rules for characters afflicted with lycanthropy. The following text applies to Were-Raven characters specifically. A character cursed with Were-Raven lycanthropy gains a dexterity of 15 if his or her score isn't already higher. Attacks and damage rolls for the Were-Raven's bite are based on whichever is higher, the character's strength or dexterity. The bite of a Were-Raven in Raven form deals one piercing damage with no ability modifier. This carries the Curse of Lycanthropy, which can be read in more details in the Monster Manual. The Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is hidden in the inn, the Keepers of the Feather don't reveal where the treasure is until they know the characters are capable of protecting it. As a way of testing their abilities, Erwin gives the characters the following quest. Erwin takes you aside and keeps his voice low. My supply of wine is nearly gone, and the next shipment is overdue. I'll give you what you seek if you bring me my wine. The vineyard and winery is a few miles west of here. Just follow the old Zalovich road and the signs. Erwin fails to mention that his cantankerous father, Davian Martikov, owns the local winery and vineyard. A wizard of wines, there's bad blood between Erwin and his father, whom Erwin and Danica referred to as the Old Crow. Although Erwin could easily visit the winery himself, he considers dealing with his father to be a worthy test of the character's competence, and makes good on his promises if they complete the quest and return with his wine shipment. Erwin sends a were-raven in raven form to observe the party's progress from a distance. If the characters get in trouble, the were-raven reports to Erwin at once. Area N2A The Well A three-foot-high stone rim surrounds the mouth of this forty-foot-deep moss-lined well. The inn draws fresh water from this well. Area N2B Outside Staircase A wooden staircase hugs the outer wall of the inn and leads up to guest quarters on the upper floor in areas N2L and N2M. The sturdy wooden door at the top of the stairs can be barred from the inside. Damp cloaks hang from pegs in the entrance portico. 
The tavern is packed with tables and chairs, with narrow paths meandering between them. A bar stretches along one wall, under a balcony that can be reached by a wooden staircase that hugs the north wall. Another balcony overhangs the entrance to the east. All the windows are fitted with thick shutters and crossbars. Lanterns hang from above the bar and are resting on the tables that bathe the room in a dull orange light and cast shadows upon the wall, most of which are adorned with wolf heads mounted on wooden plaques. The double doors leading into the tap room can be barred shut from within. Mounted on braces and tucked into alcoves behind the bar are three wine barrels, each one three quarters empty. Two of the barrels contain purple grape marsh number three, a cheap wine, and the third contains red dragon crush, a fine wine. A brass spigot is hammered into each barrel. Danica Martakov usually tends the bar while her husband busies himself in the kitchen in area N2E. Their boys, Brom and Bray, scamper about and easily get underfoot. Between the dawn and noon, there are no patrons here, and the Matakovs are upstairs in their bedrooms in areas N2O and N2P, or in the attic in area N2Q. From noon to dusk, the taproom holds 1D4 local patrons, lawful good male and female commoners, between dusk and midnight, 2d8 Valachians are in here. In addition to the commoners mentioned here, there may be some of the following present during this time. Wolf Hunters Zolda Zovarovich and Yevgeny Kushkin, neutral male human scouts, are local hunters who frequent the Blue Water Inn. They kill wolves and sell their meat for a living. Their work is dangerous and bloody. Both men are grim and have haunted looks in their eyes. These are two dour fellows, but they seldom pass up an opportunity to earn coin. If the characters are looking for guides or information on the land of Barovia, Zoldar and Yevgeny can be of service. They aren't afraid to venture beyond Valakai's walls during the day, and they know the woods and valley well. They're willing to serve as guides for five gold pieces per day, will provide directions to important landmarks in exchange for free drinks. They think it's foolish to travel in this cursed realm. At night, they won't do so unless their payment is exorbitant, at a hundred gold pieces or more. On rare occasions, when he has something to say, Zolda speaks brusquely, while Yevgeny usually parrots his friends in not so many words. Zolda has a notch in his bow for every wolf he's killed while Yevgeny adds a new swatch to his wolfskin cloak every time he makes a kill. Both men have families, but spend most of their time together, either drowning their sorrows or hunting in the woods. Most of the wolves' heads that adorn the tavern walls are a result of their handiwork. The Watcher Brothers Nikolai and Cal Watcher, neutral male human nobles, are brothers of noble birth. They are brash drunkards, always looking for trouble though they are smart enough not to pick fights with well-armed strangers. Their mother, Fiona Watcher, see Area N4, is an influential figure in town, but her sons never talk about her. They'd rather listen to tales of characters' harrowing adventures or hear about how the characters plan to free Valakai from the Burgomaster's madness. Rick Tavio, the lone guest at the Blue Water Inn at present, is a colourfully dressed half-elf bard who goes by the name Rictavio, a false identity adopted by the legendary vampire hunter Rudolf van Richten. He regales tavern patrons with stories so outrageous they'd be hardly believable, yet he asserts that they are true indeed. Rictavio claims to be a carnival ringmaster from a distant land. He's been staying at the inn for almost a month, taking advantage of Erwin Martikov's generosity and good nature. When he arrived, he was accompanied by a monkey named Piccolo. The monkey isn't welcome at the inn, so Rictavio gave it to the local toy maker in Area N7. Rictavio admits to not having any musical talent, but manages to entertain locals nonetheless with his story of faraway places. Twice each day, at dawn and again at dusk, he leaves the inn with a couple of apples and a cooked wolf steak wrapped in a handkerchief. He claims the food is for his portly friend, the destitute toy maker in Area N7, and his pet monkey. In fact, the apples are for his horse, Drusilla, 
in area N2F, and the stake is for his captured saber-toothed tiger in area N5. During his stay at the inn, Rictavio is quietly gathering information on the Keepers of the Feather, trying to figure out the identities of all the were-ravens in town. He's also trying to learn as much as he can about the Vistani, particularly the ones living in the camp just outside the town in area N9. Once he concludes that they are in league with Strad, Rictavio plans to unleash his trained saber-toothed tiger upon them, with or without the support of the were-ravens. Rictavio wears a hat of disguise and a ring of mind shielding to conceal his identity. He carries an iron key that unlocks the door to his carnival wagon in area N5. For the purpose of his statistics, Rictavio is similar to a grave domain cleric. He has the ability to cast spells as a 9th level spellcaster and deals extra damage to undead that he attacks. His cantrips are Guidance, Light, Mending and Thermaturgy. His first level spells are Cure Wounds, Detect Evil and Good, Protection from Evil and Good, and Sanctuary. His second level spells are Augury, Lesser Restoration, Protection from Poison. His third level spells are Magic Circle, Remove Curse, and Speak with Dead. His fourth level spells are Death Ward and Freedom of Movement, and his fifth level spell is Dispel Evil and Good. Several months ago, a colourfully dressed half-elf bard came to Barovia in a carnival wagon with a pet monkey on his shoulder. He took over an abandoned tower on Lake Baratok before rolling into the town of Valakai several months later, claiming to be a carnival ringmaster in search of new actors. He began regaling locals with tales of distant lands. A monster hunter, the half-elf ringmaster is in fact a legendary human vampire hunter named Rudolf van Richten. Van Richten's tale is a sad one. A scholar and a doctor from a land called Darkon, he married his childhood sweetheart Ingrid, and together they had a son, Erasmus. When he was 14, Erasmus was stolen away by a Vistani and sold to a vampire named Baron Metis to be used as a companion. By the time Van Richten found his son, it was too late. The Baron had already transformed Erasmus into a vampire spawn. Erasmus begged his father to end his suffering, which Van Richten did by pounding a wooden stake through his son's chest. Baron Metis avenged that deed by killing Van Richten's wife, and Van Richten has lived with the horror of his family's destruction ever since. After destroying Baron Metis in turn, Van Richten sought revenge against the Vistani and took up a life of hunting evil monsters. The Waiting Game Van Richten isn't a young man anymore, and he knows his road is coming to an end, but his work isn't done. He has come to Barovia to kill Strad von Zarevich, the greatest vampire of them all. Van Richten has studied Strad for years, and knows he can't hope to best the vampire in a straight-up confrontation. He must wait for the right moment to strike. He has good evidence to suggest that Strad periodically hibernates in his coffin, sometimes for years, but all is quiet in the realm. While he bides his time, Van Richten hides in plain sight, with the aid of the Hat of the Disguise, and his thoughts protected by the Ring of Mind Shielding. He's trying to learn more about the Keepers of the Feather, a society of were-ravens that oppose Strad, while trying not to expose the secret society to their mutual enemy. He thinks the were-ravens may prove helpful when time comes. Van Richten also wants to take out as many of Strad's spies as he can, starting with the evil Vistani. The man with a plan. Van Richten doesn't know that his former protege, a good aligned Vistana named Esmeralda Avnir, has come to Barovia looking for him. He taught her many of his monster hunting techniques, but she doesn't know all of his tricks and disguises. So far their paths haven't crossed. In the event that Van Richten becomes aware of Esmeralda's presence, he does his utmost to protect her without putting his own plans in jeopardy. If he can manipulate a party of adventurers into keeping an eye on her, he will do so. Van Richten works alone. The curse placed on him long ago by a Vistani seer brings doom to those he befriends. Furthermore, he believes too much is at stake to risk exposure. Consequently, if he thinks he's in danger of being unmasked, he retreats to his tower, or another quiet corner of Strad's domain. Rictavio's ideal is that evil cannot go unchallenged. 
His bond is to protect those that he loves, and that he must keep a distance between them and his enemies. His flaw is that he is cursed, and that he will never have peace. Area N2D, the wine storage. This hallway contains three curtained alcoves, as well as a larger area stuffed with wine barrels. The Matikovs store their wine here. Tucked behind red curtains are three alcoves, each one containing a half-emptied wine barrel lying on its side in a wooden brace. Twelve empty wine barrels are piled on top of each other near the door to the kitchen in area N2E. All the barrels have the Wizard of Wine's name burned into them. Nine of the fifteen barrels, including two of the barrels in the curtain alcoves, have the following label burned into their sides. Under the winery's name, Purple Grape Marsh No. 3, six of the fifteen barrels, including one of the barrels in the curtain alcoves, has a different label, Red Dragon Crush. The double doors that lead outside can be barred shut from within. This room looks like a kitchen of someone who loves to cook. It has piles of pots and walls lined with utensils and shelves of ingredients, and all manner of pleasant odours. Two lanterns hang above a sturdy pine work table in the middle of the clutter. A pot of soup bubbles on the hearth. Owen Martikov, who prepares most of the meals, is found in here throughout the day. He occasionally receives help from his two boys, but they are easily distracted. A cupboard against the east wall holds most of the inn's supply of cutleries and dishware. None of it is valuable. A door in the west wall leads outside and is usually barred from the inside. A secret door in the west end of the south wall can be pushed open to reveal a wooden staircase that leads up to area N2I. Area N2F, the stable. The sliding wooden doors on the west wall of this room are held shut by an iron lock and chain. Erwin carries the key to the lock. The doors to the north and south can be barred shut from inside, but they are usually unlocked. You hear the squawking of birds and the plaintive whinny of a horse as you peer inside this stable. The stalls are clean and well maintained, and one of them contains a grey mare. A small door is set into the east wall and a wooden ladder gives access to a loft overhead. Perched on the wooden railing that encloses the loft are dozens of ravens. Any character who has a horse can keep it here for one silver piece per night. The grey mare is a draft horse named Drusilla, and she likes apples. The horse belongs to Rick Tavio. The small door in the east wall can be pulled open to reveal the area N2G. The loft is described in area N2H. Area N2G, the storage room. This small room lies under a wooden staircase, the area N2I. Hanging from the wooden pegs are saddles and barding to equip two horses. In an unlocked wooden chest are dozens of horseshoes, a wooden mallet, and a mound of horseshoe nails. Area N2H, Raven's Loft. Dim light spilling in through a pair of dirt encrusted windows reveals a pile of hay with pitchforks sticking out of them. Ravens rule this roost. You can see hundreds of them. Characters who search through the loft thoroughly find three pitchforks and a locked wooden chest buried under a pile of hay. Inside the locked chest are 140 electrum pieces, 70 platinum pieces, two elixirs of health, three potions of healing, and a grey bag of tricks. The coins are embossed with the profiled likeness of Strad von Zarevich. This is located next to a secret door. If the characters tamper with the chest, the ravens gather together into four swarms of ravens and attack. If two swarms are killed, the others flee. Otherwise, they cease their attacks if the characters leave the chests alone. If the fighting continues for more than three rounds, Erwin Martikov and two other were-ravens hear the ruckus and investigate in human form. A secret door in the back of the loft can be pushed open to reveal a bedchamber, area N2P, beyond. No ability check is required to spot the secret door, because the light in the room beyond slips through the door's cracks. Area N2I, the secret stairs and hall. A wooden staircase to the north descends 15 feet to a landing. A window dimly illuminates a short wooden panelled hallway that runs west to east. 
Guests aren't told about this secret inn's hallway. Rictavio knows of its existence because he has heard the Martikov boys opening and closing the secret door closest to his room in area N2N. At each end of this area is a secret door, each of which is easy to spot from inside the hallway with no ability check required. The northern secret door at the bottom of the staircase can be pulled open to reveal a kitchen in area N2E and beyond. The eastern secret door can be pulled open to reveal a balcony in area N2J that overlooks the tap room. Area N2J, the great balcony. A wooden balcony stretches the full length of the tap room, enclosed by a wooden railing carved with raven motifs. The tap room's many lanterns illuminate the rafters and cast ominous shadows on the peak ceiling. The balcony floor is 15 feet above the taproom floor. A secret door at the south end of the western wall can be pushed open to reveal a wood panelled hallway in area N2I and beyond. Area N2K, the guest balcony. This 20 foot long balcony provides a clear view of the bar and has a wooden railing carved with raven motifs. The tap room's many lanterns illuminate the rafters and cast ominous shadows on the peak ceiling. The balcony is 15 feet above the taproom floor. Area N2L, the guest rooms. These two rooms have identical furnishings. Two cozy beds with matching foot lockers rest on the far corners of this 15 foot square room. Wolf furs are heaped atop each bed. Between the beds, a lamp sits on a table under a shuttered window. Two tall black wardrobes stand against the wall by the door. The door to this room can be unlocked from the inside, and each guest gets a key. Erwin and Danica carry spare keys. The footlockers and wardrobes are empty, and they are used for the guests. Area N2M, the guest room. Four plain beds with straw mattresses line the north wall of this well-lit room. Each bed comes with a matching footlocker to store clothing and other belongings. A table and four chairs occupy the corner across from the room. An oil lamp resting on the table casts a bright yellow flame. The door to this room can be locked from the inside, and each guest receives a key. Erwin and Danica carry the spare keys. The footlockers are empty and are used for the guests. Area N2N, the private guest room. Rictavio has a key to this room, which is locked at all times. Erwin and Danica carry spare keys. The door's lock can be picked, but discretion is called for because the door is in plain view of the tap room below. This small guest room contains a bed heaped with wolf furs, a footlocker, a tall wardrobe, and a writing desk with a matching chair. An oil lamp rests atop the desk near a journal bound in a red leather jacket. Rictavio sleeps here between midnight and dawn. At dawn he leaves to check his horses at area N2F and his wagon at area N5, returning to the inn around the room between noon and dusk. There's a 40% chance that he is here, otherwise he's in the tap room in area N2C. At dusk, he leaves the inn to tend to his horse and his wagon again and then returns to his room to retire for the night. Rictavio is too clever to leave anything valuable or incriminating in his room. The footlocker and the wardrobe contain nothing but common clothes and travel wear. Rictavio's Journal The journal on the desk is a bit of an artifice that Rictavio created to perpetuate the illusion that he is an entertainer in search of new acts for his travelling carnival. His writing makes frequent mention of conversations with Drusilla, which the journal fails to mention is the name of Rictavio's horse, and recounts the many long and tedious journeys by the wagon. Rictavio has also written other various oddities he has seen in his travels, including the following. A wear child, a boy who transformed into a rabbit on nights of the full moon. A half-orc woman named Gorabacha, who could chew through iron chains. A giant man-eating plant that had the most remarkable singing voice. A pair of conjoined goblins. A small man with no legs named Fillmore Stunk, who could drink whole casks of wine without getting drunk. Area N2O, the boy's bedroom. A large painted toy box rests between two small cozy beds. 
Murals of ravens in flight are painted on the walls above the wood panelling. Brom and Bray Martakova don't spend much time in this room. The toy box contains a pile of neglected toys, many of them etched with the slogan, He's no fun, he's no Binsky. The toys include the following. A miniature puppet theatre with an appropriately sized marinette of a king, a queen, a prince, a princess, an executioner, a tax collector, a dunce, a vampire, and a vampire hunter. A garish toy Vestani wagon hitched with a wooden horse and filled with wooden Vestani figures. A pair of painted wooden clown masks, one displaying a mean scowl and the other a frightened expression. A wooden spinning top painted with images of scarecrows chasing children through the forest. And a stuffed, real, bat on puppet strings. A hidden trap door in the eight foot high ceiling opens into a secret attic in area N2Q. Area N2P, the master bedroom. Matching end tables flank a large wooden frame bed with a red silk canopy. Across from the bed hangs a tapestry depicting a beautiful mountain valley. The other walls are dominated by a fireplace and wardrobe. Erwin and Danica retire to this room every night before heading to the attic in area N2Q to sleep. This room is for appearances only and contains no valuables. A secret door at the west end of the south wall can be pulled open to reveal the loft beyond in area N2H. A hidden trap door in the 8 foot high ceiling opens into the secret attic in area N2Q. Area N2Q, the secret attic. This 10 foot wide, 35 foot long attic has a ceiling that slants down towards the west, dropping from a height of 8 feet to a height of 5 feet. Four straw nests cover the floor and a locked iron strongbox sits against the north wall. A small square opening in the south wall leads outside. Two trap doors with iron hinges are set into the floor. The Martikovs sleep here at night in hybrid form. The opening in the south wall is just big enough for a raven or other tiny creature to pass through. The were ravens can use this opening as an escape route. Two trap doors are clearly visible on the floor and can be pulled open to reveal the bed chambers in area N2O and N2P that lie directly beneath them. In the iron lock box there is a sack of 150 electrum pieces, each coin bearing the profiled visage of Strad von Zarovich. There's also six pieces of jewelry worth 250 gold pieces each and three potions of healing. The lock can be picked with thieves tools with a successful DC 20 dexterity check or Erwin carries the key. If your fortune of Ravenloft relates to this area, the master of coin, the rogue, then you can find your fortune of Ravenloft treasure in this box. Area N3, the Burgomaster's Mansion. This mansion has walls of plastered stone that display many scars where the plaster has fallen away from age and neglect. Drapes cover every window, including a large arch opening above the mansion's double entrance doors. People come and go from the mansion at all hours during the day. Guards bring criminals cited for malicious unhappiness. Men and women arrive carrying bundles of twigs, which are piled about the mansion's grand foyer in area N3A, until the construction of the Wicker Sun for the Festival of the Blazing Sun, if the characters knock on the front doors, a maid, a lawful good female human commoner, lets them in and escorts them to the den in area N3E and leaves to fetch the Baron. Role-playing the Vakolovich family. Use the following information to role-play the Burgomaster and his family. The Baron. The Burgomaster, Baron Vargas Vakolovich, a neutral evil male human noble, is a ruthless heel who prides himself on his good breeding and finely honed leadership skills. He stages repeated celebrations to foster happiness, and his all will be well has become a sad and tiresome punchline. Baron Vakolovich has convinced himself that if he can make everyone in Valakai happy, the town will slip free of Strad's grasp. The Baron has a brittle ego, and he lashes out at anyone who pokes fun at his festivals or treats him disrespectfully. He has two pet mastiffs that follow him everywhere, as well as a murderous and deformed henchman 
named Izek Strazny. In addition to his weapons, Izek carries a ring of iron keys that unlocks the stocks in the town square in Area N8. If the characters get on his bad side, the Baron accuses them of being spies of the Devil Strad and sends 12 guards to arrest them, seize their weapons, and run them out of town. If the guards fail in their duty, the Baron sends Izek to rally a mob of 30 commoners to lynch the party. If the commoners also fail, the Baron summons 12 remaining guards to defend his mansion, giving the characters the run of the town. If the characters get on his good side, he insists that they join him in the next festival as special guests and asks that they tell everyone that everything will indeed be well. Two members of the Baron's household staff have vanished in the past week, the butler and the Baroness's lady-in-waiting. The Baron has charged Izek with finding out what happened to them, but the investigation isn't Izek's forte. Searches have been organized to no avail. Izek Strazny Izek and his sister were born in Valakai. One morning, their father and their uncle took them fishing on Lake Zarovich. On their way back to town, a direwolf attacked Izek and bit off his right arm. His father carried Izek back to town while his uncle distracted the beast. His sister ran and hid in the woods and was never seen again. Unlike his sister, Izek was born without a soul. As time wore on, he forgot his lost sister and learned to cope with his disability. An orphaned killer. Izek's parents succumbed to their grief, leaving him an orphan. He soon became a sociopath. Other children ruthlessly mocked him because of his dead family and missing arm, but he was a large boy and had no trouble killing them and disposing of their bodies. He was eventually caught in the act and brought to the burgomaster. Instead of punishing the boy for his crimes, Baron Vakolovich pardoned Izek and took him into his home. Izek has been loyal to the burgomasters ever since, enjoying the power of his position and the comforts of his master's mansion. When he isn't enforcing the burgomaster's will, Izek drinks copious amounts of wine. A fiendish gift. After years of doing Baron Vakolovich's dirty work, Izek awakened from a drunken stupor one morning to find that he had grown a new arm to replace the one he lost. The new appendage has barbed spines and elongated fingers and long nails. He can create fire with the snap of his fiendish fingers and has used the flame to put the fear of the devil in every Valachian. A doll collector. Perhaps more disturbing than his fiendish arm and his murderous nature is Izek's collection of dolls, which he keeps in his bedroom in the Burgomaster's mansion. Izek often dreams of a beautiful young woman and for years has forced a local toy maker named Gadolf Binsky to create dolls in her likeness. The woman is Irina Kolyana, although Izek doesn't know her name. Family is forever. Izek has dreams of Irina. If he spots her traveling with the player characters, he tries to take her by force to the Burgomaster's mansion. If he succeeds, he holds her captive in his bedroom in area N3J. Unknown to Izek and Irina, they are brother and sister. Irina fled after Izek was attacked by the dire wolf and became lost in the woods. She wandered for days in shock until she was found and adopted by Kolyan Indurovich in the village of Barovia. Izek covets her in an unwholesome way and won't allow anyone or anything to come between them. Mechanically, Izek is similar to a fighter with the addition of being able to produce flame and hurl it as a ranged spell attack. Izek's traits are the following. His ideal is that fear is a powerful weapon and I'll use it to get whatever I want. His bond is that he is loyal to his master, Baron Valakolovich, for he brought me into his home. I owe him his life, but he isn't my family. His flaw is that he would do anything and kill anything to find his sister. The Baroness. At risk of sacrificing her sanity, the Baron's wife, Lydia Petrovna, a lawful good female human commoner, has embraced her husband's philosophy of happiness. She laughs at the Baron's every comment, to the extent that it has become a nervous reflex. She tries to spread good cheer by throwing a daily tea and sandwich party in the parlour for her dearest friends, many of them poor folk who tolerate the Baroness only because they crave something warm to eat and drink. Lydia is a God-fearing woman 
and the younger sister of the town priest, Father Lucian Petrovich. She is a descendant of Tasha Petrovna, a priest entombed in Castle Ravenloft. The Baronet. The Baron's miserable son, Victor Vakolovich, a neutral evil male human mage, has confined himself to the attic in Area N3T, where he is content to avoid the unwanted attention of his mother and the disapproving glares of his father. Years ago, Victor found an old spellbook in the mansion's library and used it to teach himself magic. He has been busy constructing a teleportation circle in hope of escaping Barovia and leaving his parents to their doom. Area N3A, the entrance hall and vestibule. Framed portraits adorn the walls of the grand foyer, which feature a wide staircase with sculpted railing. A long carpeted hallway attaches to the foyer that stretches almost the length of the mansion and has several doors leading away from it, including the one at the far end. Bundles of twigs are heaped against the walls. The twigs are being stored here until they can be fashioned into a wooden effigy of the sun for the Festival of the Blazing Sun. The stairs climb to the upper gallery in area N3I. The portraits depict the Baron and his family and their ancestors. Close inspection reveals some of the people portrayed look very much alike. Tucked into the northeast corner of the foyer is the vestibule packed with fine cloaks, coats and boots. Area N3B, the parlour. This parlour contains a fine array of furnishings and draperies with an overall feminine touch. The Baroness sometimes entertains guests here. Area N3C, the dining room. Characters can hear the chatter of female voices as they approach the room. The first time they peer inside, read, A chandelier of wrought iron fixed with wax candles hangs above a polished wooden dining table. Around the table are seated eight women of various ages in comfortable high-backed chairs. They wear faded clothes, drink tea and devour cakes while a ninth well-dressed woman, very pleased with herself, circles the table and talks excitedly about decorations for the impending festival. The women seated at the table are eight Valachian peasants, lawful good female commoners, invited to spend time with the Baroness, Lydia Petrovna, who is bribing them with tea and cake. Lydia has assigned these women the task of stitching children's costumes and weaving together a wicker sun for the Festival of the Blazing Sun. Lydia assumes the characters that are here are on invitation of her husband, the Burgomaster, she calls for a maid to take them to the den in area N3E and then informs Baron Vakolovich in area N2L that his guests have arrived. A serving table stands in one corner of the dining hall. Area N3D, the preparation room. White sheets cover two plain wooden tables in the center of this room. Neatly arranged atop one table is a complete set of polished silverware. The other table is completely covered with wicker baskets containing turnips and beets. The beets and turnips are for the Festival of the Blazing Sun. The silverware set found in here is worth about 150 gold pieces. Area N3E, the den. Characters who are asked to see the Burgomaster are brought here. Padded chairs and couches line the wall of this cozy carpeted den. The room reeks of pipe smoke and mounted on the east wall is the head of an angry-looking brown bear. The mounted bear's head is meant to unnerve visitors. It serves as a subtle warning not to antagonize the Burgomaster, who spends most of his time in the library, area N3L. Although the Burgomaster claims that his father killed the bear, the head was actually a gift given to his family by the late Zolda Gigorovich, father of the wolf hunter Zolda Sadorovich in area N2. Area N3F, the servants' quarters. This room contains four simple beds and an equal number of plain wooden trunks. The household staff consists of a maid, a lawful good female human commoner, and a cook, a lawful good male human commoner. The other two beds belong to the butler and the baroness's lady-in-waiting, both of whom have gone missing, which will be explained in area N3T. The trunks contain the staff's clothing and uniform. Area N3G, the kitchen. A cook wearing a white apron over a black smock busies himself in the warm, well-appointed kitchen. 
A staircase in one corner climbs to the upper floor. The staircase leads to the upstairs gallery in area N3I. A door in the west wall leads to a garden outside. The door is usually locked, and both the cook and the burgomaster carry keys to unlock it. Area N3H, the pantry. This pantry contains shelves of foodstuffs, although half of the shelves are bare. Two barrels of wine stand against the east wall. The pantry has not been fully stocked for as long as anyone can remember, but two barrels contain a fine wine called Red Dragon Crush, created by the Wizards of Wine's winery. This fact is burned into the side of each barrel. Area N3I, the upstairs gallery. If characters arrive here from the entrance hall in area N3A, read, the staircase climbs 20 feet to a beautifully appointed gallery that continues towards the west, running almost the length of the mansion. Framed landscape paintings line the wall, and red silk drapes cover a 10-foot arch window of leaded glass. If the characters arrive here from the kitchen in area N3G, read, the staircase climbs to a 10-foot wide gallery that stretches almost the length of the mansion. Breathtaking paintings of landscapes line the wall. Two separate narrow hallways lead away from the gallery to the north. Area N3J, Izek's bedroom. The door to the room is locked. Izek Strazny carries the only key. The following description assumes the characters have met Eilina Koryana. If the characters haven't met her, then don't read the last sentence. Dolls. This room is full of pretty little dolls with powdered white skin and auburn hair. Some of them are dressed beautifully, others plainly. Some of the dolls fill a long bookshelf, and others have been arranged into neat rows on a wall-mounted shelf. Others have been piled atop a bed and in heavy wooden chests. What's the most odd thing is that all of these dolls, apart from their clothing, look the same. They all look like Irina Koliana. The Burgomaster's monstrous henchman, Izek Strazny, sleeps here at night. During the day, he is in town taking care of his master's business. Izek's chest is unlocked and contains a heap of wrinkled clothes, under which is a non-magical short sword. A thorough search of the room reveals a few empty wine bottles under the bed. The label on each bears the winery, the Wizard of the Wines, and the wine's name, Purple Grape Marsh No. 3. Izek's Doll Collection Each doll has a small tag stitched into its clothing that reads, is no fun, is no Blinsky. Izek has had the local toy maker, Gadolf Blinsky, in Area N7, craft the dolls in Arena's likeness. Area N3K, Victor's Bedroom. This handsomely appointed room contains a canopy bed, a low bookshelf, and a full-length mirror on a wooden frame on the wall across from the door. In the north wall is an arch window of leaded glass. Nothing here seems unusual. Nothing about this bedroom betrays Victor's deviant nature or magical proclivities. The books include collections of Barobian fables and tomes about mythology, heraldry and other innocuous subjects. Area N3L The Library Floor to ceiling shelves line every wall of this windowless room. The number of books contained here is nothing short of astounding. A brass oil lamp sits atop a large desk in the centre of the room. The chair behind the desk is comfortably padded and has the symbol of a roaring bear stitched into its back cushion. If the burgomaster has not been drawn elsewhere, he is here. Add, standing behind the chair, holding an open book, is a bear of a man. His breastplate, rapier, silk tunic and greasy beard glisten in the lamplight. Resting on a small rug to his left and right are a pair of black mastiffs. Baron Vargas Vakulovich never goes anywhere without his two mastiffs. A paranoid man, he wears his breastplate and rapier, even while relaxing in his library. Two of his servants, the butler and his wife's lady-in-waiting, have vanished without a trace in the past week, so he has good cause to be worried. The Baron believes that everyone else is beneath him, and those who question his word or challenge his authority must be humbled. He won't pick a fight with the well-armed stranger, however, if he can't make the character yield to his authority, he swallows his pride until he can circle around with Izek Strazny and assemble his guards to run them out of town. 
The Baron's desk contains three drawers stuffed with blank sheets of parchment, jars of ink, and writing quills. It also holds thick books of tax records dating back to the time of the Baron's father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. The Baron wears a signet ring and carries three keys, one that unlocks the outside door in area N3G, and two keys for the door and manacles in area N3M. There are so many books here on so many subjects, you can roll a d12 to determine what players might find. An alchemist tome, a bestiary of strange beasts, a biography of a forgotten king or queen, a book of exotic recipes, a book of heraldry, a book of military strategy, an epic novel, a guide to fine wines, a heretical text, a historical text, poetry anthology, or a theological text. Area N3M, the locked closet. The door to this room is locked. The Baron carries the key. Chained to the back wall of this otherwise empty closet is a badly beaten man wearing nothing but a loincloth. The iron shackles have cut into his wrists, causing blood to trickle down his hands. The man is a Valakian shoemaker named Udo Lokovic, a lawful neutral male human commoner. He was arrested during the Wolf's Head Jamboree for carrying a sign that suggested Valakian should feed the Baron to the wolves. Baron Vakolovich has the key to Udo's manacles. The manacles break if they take 10 damage or more from a single weapon attack. If the characters release Udo, his first desire is to return home. Later, he plans to tell Father Lucian, in Area N1, of his ill treatment in the Burgomaster's estate. If the Baron discovers that Udo has escaped or has been set free, he sends Izek to find the shoemaker and bring him back for further questioning. Under great duress, Udo provides the name and descriptions of those who liberated him, turning the Burgomaster against the characters. Area N3N, the Master's Bedroom Closet Cloaks, coats, gowns and other fancy apparel hang from hooks in this closet. Arranged on low shelves are many fine shoes, slippers and boots. Area N3O, the master's bedroom. Time has faded the grandeur of this master bedroom. The furnishings have lost some of their colour and their splendour. A short pull rope hangs from a wooden trap door in the ceiling. The Baron and the Baroness sleep in one bed at night. Nothing of value is kept here. The trapdoor in the ceiling can be pulled down to reveal an attic room, area N3R. An unfolding wooden ladder comes down to allow easy access. Area N3P, the bridal gown and spirit mirror. This room smells of powder and fine perfume. A vanity with a mirror stands against one wall next to a faceless wooden mannequin wearing a white bridal gown. Mounted on another wall is a full-length mirror with a gilded frame. A door in one corner leads to a garter robe. The Baroness used to while away long hours in this room, fondling her perfume collection and searching for solace in her own reflection. Since her lady-in-waiting went missing several days ago, the Baroness has spent almost no time here. The Bridal Gown The white gown stored here belongs to the Baroness. It reminds her of happier times. The Magical Mirror a Detect Magic spell reveals that the gilded mirror on the wall radiates an aura of conjuration magic. None of the mansion's current occupants are aware of this fact because the mirror's magic hasn't been used in generations. Casting an Identify spell on the mirror reveals that an assassin's ghost is magically bound to it. The spell also reveals a forgotten rhyme needed to summon the ghost. Magic mirror on the wall, summon forth your shade. Night's dark vengeance heed my call and wield your murderous blade. The entity of the mirror is the spirit of a nameless assassin who once belonged to a secret society called the Baal Vazai. If a creature speaks the rhyme while standing within five feet of the mirror and staring at its own reflection, the assassin's ghost appears nearby. The form of the spirit depends on the alignment of the one who summoned it. A non-evil summoner if the summoner isn't evil, the spirit assumes a solid form, appearing as a darkly handsome 30-year-old man with bloodshot eyes. He has the statistics of an assassin, but doesn't speak, and he disappears to ether if he is reduced to zero hit points. The assassin's summoner can command him to kill one living creature within Stride's domain. 
that the summoner mentions by name. The assassin automatically knows the distance and direction to the named target. The assassin attacks any other creature that tries to prevent him from completing his assignment. Once he completes his task, the assassin disappears. If commanded to attack a creature that is either dead or undead, or if he isn't given an appropriate name within one round of being summoned, the assassin disappears. If the summoner, however, is evil, the ghost manifests as a pair of floating bloodshot eyes and strong spectral hands. The hands try to wrap around the summoner's neck. The spectral eyes and hands have the statistics of a ghost, but without the etherealness or possession actions. The ghost attacks the summoner until one of them drops to zero hit points, at which point it disappears. Once the power of the mirror is used, the mirror becomes dormant till the next dawn. The mirror has an AC of 10 and hit points of 5, but is immune to poison and psychic damage. Destroying it lays the assassin spirit to rest, causing the manifestation to disappear if it's present. The mirror corrupts those who use it to do evil. Summoning the assassin isn't evil, but using him to commit a murder is. Each time a creature uses the mirror for its purpose, there is a cumulative 25% chance that the creature's alignment will shift to neutral evil. If a character touches the mirror and speaks Strahd's name, there is a 50% chance that Strahd will take notice and appear on the mirror's surface. In this form, the vampire cannot be harmed. He tries to charm one humanoid he can see within 30 feet of the mirror. Whether the target resists the effects or not, Strahd's smiling visage invites the characters to dine at Castle Ravenloft, then fades away. A creature charmed by Strahd feels compelled to accept the vampire's invitation. Area N3Q, the bathroom. An iron tub with claw feet stands against a black wall. Neatly folded towels rest atop a table near the door. Area N3R, the attic room. Characters are most likely to enter this room via the trap door in the ceiling of the master's bedroom in area N3O. This dusty 20 foot square room has a high pitched ceiling that reaches its peak 20 feet above. The wooden rafters are shrouded in cobwebs except for an old table with a lantern on it. The room is empty. A door to the south wall can be pulled open to area N3S. Area N3S, the attic storage. This attic is full of old forgotten things draped in white sheets. Piled around them are barrels, crates, trunks, and old furnishings covered in cobwebs and dust. You see clear footprints through the maze. Characters can follow a single set of human footprints in the dust that lead to area N3T. Searching through the junk in this attic uncovers an old few paintings and antiques, but nothing of value. If the characters had the fortune of Ravenloft, the Nine of Spades, the Torturer, then they can find a treasure in one of these trunks. Each character has a cumulative 20% chance of finding the item for every hour they spend searching the attic. Area N3T, Victor's Workroom. Victor spends most of his time here, leaving only when he needs food or spell components. When the characters first set eye on the door of the room, read the following. Someone has carved a large skull into this door. Hanging from the doorknob is a wounded sign that reads, All is not well. You hear a young man's voice beyond. Anyone who inspects the carving and succeeds on a DC-14 intelligence investigation check notices a small, nearly invisible glyph etched into the skull's forehead. This is a glyph of warding. It deals 5d8 lightning damage that triggers if anyone other than Victor opens the door. The voice belongs to Victor, and he is reading aloud from his spellbook. Anyone who listens to the door can succeed on a DC-14 intelligence arcana check to tell if he's badly pronouncing some kind of teleportation spell. If the characters open the door, read, Someone has taken old mismatched furniture and created a study in this dusty lamplit chamber. Tables are strewn with pieces of parchment on which strange diagrams are drawn. A freestanding bookshelf holds a collection of bones. A dusty rug covers the floor in front of a pine box on which lounges a skeletal cat. Several more skeletal cats skulk about. Most unnerving of all is the sight of three small children standing with their backs to you on the northeast corner of the room. If the characters trigger the glyph of warding, or otherwise announce their arrival, then Victor casts greater invisibility on himself 
and hides in a corner, otherwise he's visible. If the characters can see Victor, read, In the centre of the room, perched on a stool, is a thin young man with a premature streak of grey in his hair. He cradles an open book, leather bound in his arms. Victor found a spell book in his father's library, and he's using it to teach himself the art of spell casting. Only recently has he been able to decipher some of its high level spells. He's a weird, awkward and off-putting fellow, who is dangerous only if threatened. For practice and for fun, Victor dug up some old cap bones from behind the Watchtower estate in Area N4, and animated them, creating six skeletal cats. Use the cat stat block, but give them dark vision out to a range of 60 feet, and immunity to poison damage, exhaustion and the poison condition. The skeletons only attack when Victor commands them to. The children standing in the corner are painted wooden dolls, dressed in clothing that Victor wore as a child. He pretends that they are his disobedient pupils. The sheets of parchment are covered with elaborate diagrams of teleportation circles. Victor drew them in an effort to learn the teleportation circle spell, which he is still trying to master. The trunk contains several bolts of silk cloth, needles and thread, a half-finished wizard's robe. Victor started to make a robe for himself, but found the work tedious and stopped. In regards to the teleportation circle, Victor's spellbook contains an incomplete text for the teleportation circle spell, along with the sigil sequences for three permanent teleportation circles, the locations of which aren't described. There's not enough text to prepare the spell properly, but that hasn't stopped Victor from trying to learn and cast it. Victor recently inscribed his own version of a teleportation circle on the floor. It's hidden under the rug so that his parents don't find it. In the past couple of weeks, Victor has managed to imbue the circle with magic, but has failed to account for several factors. His circle doesn't fade after use, nor does it function like a teleportation circle spell. If the circle is used to cast teleportation circle, whether the actual spell or Victor's version of it, any creature standing in the circle when the spell is cast takes 3d10 force damage and isn't teleported anywhere. If, however, this damage reduces a creature to zero hit points, the creature is disintegrated. Any character who studies the circle and succeeds on a DC-15 intelligence arcana check realizes that Victor's circle is horribly flawed and potentially deadly when used. Victor has tested his circle on two reluctant servants, compelled by his suggestion spell. In both cases, linking his circle to one of the other circles whose sigils are in his spellbook, each servant was torn apart before Victor's eyes before vanishing in a flash of purple light. Victor doesn't know how to fix the circle, but plans to make more modifications before testing it again. Victor's spellbook contains all the spells that a normal mage stat block would have prepared in the monster manual, as well as the following spells. Acid Splash, Animate Dead, Blight, Cloud Kill, Dark Vision, Glyph of Warding, Levitate, Mending, Remove Curse, and Thunder Wave. Area N4 The Watchter House This house seems disgusted with itself. A slouching roof hangs heavy over furrowed gables. A moss-covered wall sags and bulge under the weight of the vegetation. As you study the house's sullen countenance, you hear the edifice actually groan. Only then do you realize the extent to which the house hates what it has become. The Watchta family, once an influential noble line in Barovia, owns and occupies a mansion in Valakai. The house's reigning governess, Fiona Watchta, is a loyal servant of Strad. She seeks to supplant Baron Vakolovich as the new town burgomaster. Use the following information to roleplay Lady Watchta and her family and her associates. The Lady of the House Lady Fiona Watchta a lawful evil female human priest with an AC of 10 and no armor, makes no secret of her family's long-standing loyalty to the Zarovich line. She believes Strad von Zarovich is no tyrant, but at worst a negligent landlord. She would happily serve Strad as burgomaster of Valakai, but she knows that Baron Vargas Vakolovich won't give up his birthright without a fight. Fiona conspired to wed her younger daughter, Stella, to the Baron's son Victor, as part of a plot to gain a foothold in the Baron's mansion, but Stella found Victor to be demented, and he showed no interest in Stella. In fact, 
He spoke such unkind words to Stella that she went mad. Fiona had to lock her daughter away in Area N4N. Lady watched his latest scheme to gain control of Valakai is far more diabolical. She has started a cult based on devil worship, and has written a manifesto she reads to her book club, which is made up of the most fanatical group members. Inspired by her words, these zealots have created smaller cults of their own. Once her cult has enough members, Fiona plans to take on the town by force. To reward her most loyal followers, she has her pet imp stand invisibly in the center of the pentagram, then performs false rituals that call upon the Princes of Darkness to lavish their appreciation on the cultists. The imp then sprinkles on the floor a few electron coins, which the Lady Watchtower allows the cultists to keep. Another secret of Fiona's is that she sleeps with the corpse of her dead husband, Nikolai, who died of sickness nearly three years ago, whom Fiona cherished. Lady watched her cast gentle repose spells on the corpse to keep it from deteriorating. If the characters come to the Watchtower houses looking to help overthrow the Burgomaster, Lady Watchtower is all ears and suggests they start by killing the Baron's evil henchman, Izek Stranazi. She's happy to take care of the rest. If they come looking for a way to defeat Strahd, Lady Watchtower turns them away, stating no uncertain terms that she does not or will ever be Strahd's enemy. Lady Watchtower has a different list of prepared spells from that of the priest in the Monster Manual. Her cantrips are Light, Mending, and Thermotogy. Her first level spells are Command, Purify Food and Drink, and Sanctuary. Her second level spells are Augury, Gentle Repose, and Hold Person. Her third level spells are Animate Dead and Create Food and Water. Fiona's Sons Fiona sees a lot of her husband in her sons, Nikolai and Karl, neutral male human nobles, who have grown into young men with a fondness for wine and trouble. They aren't home during the day because they don't like attending to their mother or listening to her tiresome prattle. The characters might encounter them at the Blue Water Inn in Area N2 or wandering about town. The brothers are home most nights, passed out on their bed after hours of heavy drinking. Nikolai and Karl have none of their mother's ambition or mean temper. They are aware of her cult, but they don't know that she sleeps with their dead father. This would be unwelcome news and probably turn them against their mother. They only want to spend their mother's money and make most of their miserable situation, trapped as they are within the walls of Valakai, under the control of Strahd and his puppet, the Baron. Fiona Spy Fiona employs a money-grubbing spy named Ernest Lunnock, lawful evil male human, to keep her informed about everything that's happening in the town. Ernest knows about Lady Watchtower's secrets, so he would blackmail her in a heartbeat if their relationship went sour. Area N4A Front Door and Vestibule The front door is locked and reinforced with bronze bands. All of the servants carry a key, as does Lady Watchtower and Ernest Lanark. The door can be forced open with a successful DC-20 strength check. If the characters knock on the front door, a servant opens a small window cut into the door at eye height and asks their business. Suspicious looking strangers aren't invited inside, in case they're vampires. The front door opens to a narrow vestibule. Three stained glass doors in wooden frames lead from it. Two closets flank the front door. The western closet contains Lady Watch's outdoor clothes. The eastern one contains coats and boots that belong to her children. Area N4B, the staircase. A wooden staircase leads up to a balcony. At the front of the stairs is a landing with three stained glass doors with wooden frames. The staircase climbs 15 feet to the upstairs hall in area N2L. Area N4C, the kitchen. The house cook, see area N4H, rushes about his spotless kitchen most of the day, preparing meals or cleaning up after himself. A wash bin stands in the northeast corner. A slender door in the west wall leads to a small pantry. Area N4D, the storage room. This room holds crates of old clothing, as well as three barrels of drinking water, two empty wine barrels, and one full wine barrel. The wine barrels are emblazoned with the winery's name, the Wizard of Wines, and the wine's name is Red Dragon Crush. Area N4E, the back vestibule. 
The back door is locked and similar to the front door in area N4A in every respect. The vestibule has a plain wooden door that leads to areas N4D, N4F and N4H. Area N4F, the servant's closet. The servant's coats and aprons hang from hooks in this room and boots are neatly lined up against the wall. Anyone who searches the closet and makes a successful DC-10 wisdom perception check finds a secret door in the south wall. The door can be pulled open to reveal a stone staircase to area N4G that leads into the cellar. Area N4G, the secret staircase. Iron torch sconces cling to the walls of a stone staircase that cuts its way through the heart of the old house. The stairs connect the servant's closet in area N4F with the cellar in area N4S. Lady Watchster uses the staircase to reach her secret cult lair in area N4T. Area N4H, the servant's quarters. The furnishings in this room are bereft of imagination. Four simple beds with equally austere wooden chests. The Lady Watchster's four servants, neutral male and female commoners, sleep here at night. They include a cook named Davit, two maids named Madalena and Amalthea, and a valet named Halik. The servants know Lady Watcher's secrets, but they would sooner die than betray her. Area N4I, the parlor. Lady Watcher greets her guests here under the watchful eyes of her dead husband. There are three elegant couches surrounding an oval table made of black glass. All are set in front of a blazing hearth, above which hangs the portrait of a smirking nobleman, sporting a broken nose and a tangle of hair graying at the temples. Several smaller portraits hang on the north wall. The portrait above the mantle depicts Lord Nikolai Wachter, Fiona's late husband, to whom her sons are the spitting image. The other portraits depict Lady Wachter, her sons, her daughter, and various deceased family members. The parlour shares the fireplace with the den in area N4K. Ernest Lanac lurks in the den with an eavesdrops on any conversations that Lady Watchta has with the characters so that he can advise her after the depart. Area N4J, the dining room. An ornate dining table stretches the length of this room. A crystal chandelier hangs above it imperiously. The silverware is tarnished, the dishes chipped, yet all are still quite elegant. Eight chairs, their backs adorned with sculpted elk horns, Surround the table, arched windows made of latticework of iron and glass look out to a small fog-swept estate. If the characters aim to oppose Burgomaster, Lady Watchter offers them a warm meal in the dining room as a token of her support and allegiance. Area N4K, the den. Wooden panelling, embroidered rugs, colourful furnishings and a blazing fire make this chamber stifling. Mounted above the mantle is an elk's head. Across from the hearth are tall slender windows that look over the dead gardens. Ernest Lanark, Lady Watched as Spy, lounges here when he's not spying on her behalf. The room contains several treasures of value, including a golden goblet worth 250 gold pieces from which Ernest drinks wine, a crystal wine decanter worth 250 gold pieces, four electrum candelabras worth 25 gold pieces each, and a bronze urn with frolicking children painted on its side worth 100 gold pieces. Area N4L, the upstairs hall. A hallway with a window at each end wraps around the staircase railing. Framed portraits and mirrors festoon the walls, surrounding you with judging looks and dark reflections. You hear something scratching at one of the many doors. The scratching noise comes from a door to area N4N, which is locked. If the characters call out, a plaintive female voice meows like a cat and says, Can little kitty come out to play? Little kitty is sad and lonely and promises to be good this time. Really, she does. A closet at the south end of the hallway holds blanket and linens. Area N4M, the brothers' rooms. This bedroom contains nothing out of the ordinary. A neatly made bed, a table with an oil lamp on it, a handsome wooden chest, a slender wardrobe, a window box with drapes. These two rooms belong to Lady Watchter's sons, Nikolai and Carl. There's a 25% chance that one of the maids 
in area N4H is here tidying up. Area N4N, Stella's room. The door to this room is locked from both sides and only later Watchta has the key. This room is musty and dark. An iron frame bed is fitted with leather straps near the wall. The place has no other furnishings. Scurrying away from you on all four is a young woman in a soiled nightgown. She leaps onto the bed and hisses like a cat. Little kitty doesn't know you, she shouts. Little kitty doesn't like the smell of you. The young woman is Stella Watchta, a chaotic good female human commoner. Lady Watchta's insane daughter. A greater restoration spell rids her of her madness that makes her think that she is a cat. If she is cured of her madness, she blames her mother for treating her horribly and using her as a pawn to seize control of the town. Stella knows none of her mother's secrets apart from her mother's desire to overthrow the Burgomaster. Stella has nothing kind to say about the Burgomaster or his son Victor, whose very name makes her cringe. With her wits restored, Stella feels she has no one in Valakai she can count on. She latches onto any character who is kind to her. If the party takes her to St. Andrew's Church in Area N1, Father Lucian offers to look after her, and she agrees to stay with him. Area N4O, the master bedroom. The door to this room is locked. Lady watched her and her servants carry the key. A ghastly sight awaits any who peer into the room. Across from the door, a fire sputters and struggles for life in the hearth, above which hangs a framed family portrait, a noble father and mother, their two young sons, and a baby daughter in the father's arms. The sons are smiling in a way that suggests mischief. The parents look like uncrowned royalty. Wood panelling covers the wall of the room. A closet and a framed mirror flank a curtained window to the south. To the north, a wide canopied bed lies pinned between two matching end tables with oil lamps. Stretched out on one side of the bed is a man dressed in black, his eyes each covered with a copper piece. He bears a striking resemblance to the father in the painting. Lady watched his husband, Nikolai, lies in his bed, impeccably dressed, quite deceased, under the effect of the gentle repose spell. Nothing of value is on him. The closet contains shelves of fancy footwear and many fine garments, including a black ceremonial robe with a hood, similar to the ones worn by the cult fanatics in Area N4T. On a high shelf rests a locked iron chest. Lady Watchta hides the key in the chest on a tiny hook in the fireplace, under the mantel. A character who takes a minute to search the fireplace finds the key with a successful DC-10 wisdom perception check. Use of the key disables the poison needle trap hidden within the lock. The trap is a poison needle that sits within the keyhole of the chest. If the players use the key, the trap is not triggered. However, if players choose to force the lock or use thieves tools to unpick the lock, the trap will go off. A DC-20 intelligence investigation check allows the characters to deduce the trap's presence and attempt to make alterations to avoid the needle. This requires a DC-15 dexterity check using thieves tools to disarm the needle before they can disarm the lock. If the players don't notice the needle or fail the check, the needle deals 1 damage and then 2d10 poison damage. The character must then make a DC-15 constitution save or fall unconscious for 1 hour. The iron chest is lined with thin sheets of lead and contains the bones of Leo de la Cigna an enemy of the Watchta family. Leo was one of the soldiers who betrayed and murdered Strahd on the day of Sergi and Tatiana's wedding. He escaped from Castle Ravenloft, only to be hunted down and killed by the vampire Strahd. The Watchtas keep his bones under lock and key so that Leo can't be raised from the dead. If the players have the fortune of Ravenloft, the Nine of Glyphs, the traitor, they can find a hidden treasure here. Area N4P, the library. The double doors to this room are locked. Lady watched her and her servants carried the key. This room is crawling with cats. Bookshelves hug the walls, but most of the shelves are bare. Other furnishings include a desk, a chair, a table, and a wine cabinet. The room has a irregular shape. None of its angles seem quite right. 
as though the shifting of the house has set the whole place on edge. Eight cats have run of the library. These family pets have vicious dispositions, attacking anyone who tries to pick them up. The player with the highest passive perception can immediately notice that there is a small key hanging from one of the cat's collars. This key opens the locked chest in area N4Q. There is a 25% chance that one of the maids is in here, dusting the bookshelves. The cabinet holds a fine collection of wine glasses. The desk contains blank pieces of parchment, quill pens, jars of ink, wax candles and wax seals. Most of the Watchtower's family book collection was sold off years ago to cover debts, and the books that remain aren't particularly valuable. A section of the bookshelf stretches along the southernmost wall is actually a secret door on a hidden hinge. The bookshelf can be pulled outwards, revealing an open doorway that leads to Area N4Q. Area N4Q, the storage room. Behind the hinge panel of the bookcase lies a dusty 10 foot square room with a curtained window and shelves lining three walls. On the bottom shelf rests an iron chest, the other shelves are bare. The key to the chest can be found in the library on one of the cat's collars. The use of the key disables the poison needle trap hidden in the lock, which functions the same as the previously mentioned poison needle trap. This iron chest contains several items. A silk bag containing 180 electrum pieces, each coin bearing Strahd's stern visage and profile. A leather bag containing 110 gold pieces. A wooden pipe that has been passed down through many generations of the Watcher's patriarchs. Five scrolls notarized by deeds for parcels of land given to the Watcher family by Count Strahd von Zarevich nearly 40 years ago. A supple leather case containing an unbound manuscript titled the Devil We Know, a poetic manifesto written by Lady Fiona Wachta, attesting that the worship of devils can bring happiness, success, freedom, wealth, and longevity. A blasphemous treatise bound in black leather titled The Grimoire of the Four Quarters, written by the infamous Diabolus Diavustus, who was drawn and quartered for his fell practices, yet did not die. This book, in fact, is a forgery, the actual grimoire would drive the reader mad. A very old letter to Lady Lavina Wachta, an ancestor. From one Lord Velasi von Holtz, thanking Lavina for her hospitality, loyalty, and friendship over the years. Characters who have the Tome of Strahd realize that the handwriting in Lady Lavina's letter is identical to Strahd's handwriting, suggesting that Strahd and Lord Vasili are one and the same. Area N4R, the cellar entrance. If the characters approach the cellar door from the outside, read, a slanted wooden cellar door with an iron pull ring and iron hinges stand against the foundation of the house. The door is unlocked. On the other side of the door are stone steps that lead to a stone landing with wooden railing. A longer staircase extends south from the landing leading down to the cellar. Area N4S, the cellar. This large root cellar has a dirt floor. Two ascending flights of stone steps enclosed by wooden railings stand across from one another. Tracks from the earth lead from one staircase to another, and the other trail goes from both staircases to the center of the bare west wall. Four neatly made cots are set in rows against the south wall. Buried under the earthen floor are eight human skeletons, the animated remains of dead Valachians that were stolen from the church cemetery in Area N1 and animated by Lady Wachta. They rise up and attack any intruders who cross the floor. The skeletons don't attack anyone who utters the phrase, let the dead remain at rest, before setting foot on the floor. Only Lady Wachta and her sons, her servants and her loyal cult fanatics know the passphrase. The cots here are for cultists to spend the night. The footprints in the grave dirt give away the location of a secret door in the center of the western wall. Consequently, no ability checks is required to locate it. The door is soundproof and pivots open on a central axis. Area N4T, the cult headquarters. Flickering candles in iron holders fill this room with light and shadows. This room has a 10 foot high ceiling 
and large back pentagram inscribed in the stone floor. At each point of the pentagram rests a wooden chair. Seated in four of the five chairs are men and women in black robes with hoods. A young man who has a face of an angel, a balding hulk of a man, a squat middle-aged woman, and a taller younger woman with an unsettling glare. They rise to confront you. The four people are town residents, lawful evil male and female human cult fanatics, whom Lady Watchter has seduced with promises of power, wealth and a long life. They are members of her book club, eagerly awaiting for Lady Watchter to join them, to read passages from her manifesto and maybe conjure up a few coins. Resting on a fifth chair, quietly eavesdropping on the cultists is the lady's invisible imp, Majesto. The cultists are gathered here in secret and attack the characters to protect their identities. There are evil Valakians with no great importance, who are all tired of living in fear and poverty. You can give them appropriate Barovian names if you see fit. The imp doesn't get involved in the fight, unless Lady Watchter is drawn to the conflict, in which case it fights to protect its mistress. The pentagram is a non-magical decoration, though Lady Watchter would like to have a cultist believe otherwise. Area N5 Arasek Stockyard This large stockyard has several lock sheds along its periphery, and lies adjacent to a roomy warehouse. A wooden sign above the front gate reads, Arasek Stockyard. Parked at the south end of the stockyard is a sturdy carnival wagon. Its colourful paint is peeling off. Faded lettering on its side spells out the words, Rictavio's Carnival of Wonders. A heavy padlock secures the back door. The stockyard is a general store and facility where storage sheds can be rented. It is owned by a middle-aged married couple, Gunther and Yelena Arasek, lawful good male and female commoners. They sell items from the adventuring gear table in the player's handbook that have prices of 25 gold pieces or less, but at five times the price. Rictavio's Carnival Wagon The colourful half-elf bard Rictavio paid Gunther and Yelena a generous amount of gold to watch his carnival wagon with no questions asked. If the characters approach the wagon, read, The wagon suddenly lurches, as though something big has thrown itself against the wall inside. You hear the crackling of wood, the snapping of metal, and the snarl of something inhuman. Upon closer inspection, you see that the sides of the wagon are splattered with dry blood. You also see an inscription on the wagon's doorframe that reads, I bring you from the shadow into light. Rictavio carries a key to the wagon door. The lock can be picked, but it's rigged with a poison needle trap. This needle trap functions like the one in the Watchtis house, except instead of making the character unconscious, it gives them the poison condition for one hour should they fail the save. Inside the wagon is a saber-toothed tiger, with 84 hit points. It is clad in specially fitted half plate, which brings its AC to 17. It has been trained to hunt evil Vistani. The tiger recognizes Vistani by smell, and to lesser extent by the fancy garb that they wear. This tiger has a challenge rating of 3. The wagon also contains torn up remnants of a doll. Characters who make a successful DC-10 intelligence investigation check discover that the doll was in fact a colorfully dressed Vistani effigy. Stitched into its tattered pants was the slogan, Is no fun, is no blinkski. Rictavio wasn't ready to unleash the tiger on the Vistani just yet. He feeds it by dropping wolf steaks down a one foot square hatch on the wagon's roof. A character who climbs atop the wagon can spot the hatch without needing to make an ability check. If the tiger is released, it begins stalking through the streets and uses its keen sense of smell to locate either Ricavio or Piccolo in areas N2 or N7 respectively. The tiger doesn't attack anyone who isn't a Vistana except in self-defense. It attacks Vistani on sight. Rictavio can make the tiger break off its attack and lure it back to the wagon. The front seat of the wagon conceals a secret compartment that requires a DC-15 wisdom perception check to find and open. The compartment holds several items. An unlocked wooden coffer containing 50 electrum pieces bearing Strahd's profile and 6 gemstones each worth 100 gold pieces each. 
A small prayer book worth 50 gold pieces with a green leather cover and indecipherable notes in the margins. A healer's kit. Three wooden holy symbols inlaid with silver in the shape of a sunburst worth 50 gold pieces each. A silvered short sword. A hand crossbow inlaid with mother of pearl worth 250 gold pieces. A bundle of 20 silvered crossbow bolts. A worn leather case with a gold buckle worth 100 gold pieces. Inside this case there are three wooden stakes, a sack of garlic, a jar of salt, a box of holy wafers, six vials of holy water, a polished steel mirror, and a bone scroll tube with a silver stopper and chain worth 25 gold pieces. Inside this tube are two spell scrolls, one for protection from fiends and one for protection from undead. These scrolls function differently from protection from evil. Players that use an action to read the scroll enclose themselves in an invisible barrier that extends in a 5 foot radius from you and 10 feet high above you. For 5 minutes this barrier prevents any fiends or undead from entering your area or affecting you with anything within the cylinder. The cylinder moves with you and remains centered on you. However, if you move in such a way that a fiend would be inside the cylinder, the effect ends. A creature can attempt to overcome the barrier by using its action to make a DC 15 charisma check. On a success, the creature ceases to be affected by the barrier. Players with the fortunes of Ravenloft, the Seven of Stars, or the Illusionists will be able to find a treasure here in addition to these items. Area N6 the coffin maker's shop. This uninviting shop is two stories tall and has a sign shaped like a coffin above the front door. All of the window shutters are closed up tight and a deathly silence surrounds the establishment. Henrik van der Voort, a lawful evil male human commoner, is a mediocre carpenter and a troubled lonely man. He profits from the deaths of others and no one desires his company because of the ghastly nature of his handiwork. One night several months ago, Strad visited Hendrik in the guise of an imposing, well-dressed nobleman named Vasily von Holtz and promised the coffin maker good business in exchange for his help. Since then, Hendrik's workshop has become a lair packed with vampire spawn, former adventurers who were turned by Strad. These vampires are lying low for the time being. The vampires plan to attack St. Andrew's church. When Henrik learned about the sacred bones buried under the church, the vampire spawn ordered him to steal the bones, which Henrik paid Milajov, the gravedigger in Area N1, to do. Every window in Henrik's shop is a latticework of iron fitted with squares of frosted glass and locked from the inside. The outside doors of the shop are barred shut from within. If the characters knock on one of them, Henrik shouts, We're closed, go away! without opening the door. If the characters accuse Henrik of stealing the bones of St. Andrew, he shouts again, Go away! Leave me alone! If the characters break into the store, Henrik offers no resistance. He tells them where to find the bones. Upstairs in the bedroom wardrobe in area N6E, and the vampire nest upstairs in the wooden storage room in area N6F. If the characters report the theft of the bones to the Burgomaster, Baron Valakovich dispatches four guards to arrest Henrik and retrieve the bones. If the guards show up during daylight hours, Henrik surrenders himself and the bones without a fight, claiming the vampires forced him to steal the bones. If the guards come at night, Henrik surrenders himself and tells the guards where the bones are hidden, but he won't retrieve the bones for fear of being killed by the vampires. Area N6A Coffin Storage Arranged haphazardly on the floor of this musty L-shaped room are 13 wooden coffins. Henrik stores and displays coffins he has made in this room. All of them are empty. Area N6B, the junk room. A table with four chairs is in one corner of the room, with a lantern hanging from the chain directly above. Two well-made cabinets stand against the east wall. These cabinets are packed with worthless items that Henrik has collected over the years. Area N6C, the workshop. This workshop contains everything a carpenter needs to make coffins and furniture. Three sturdy work tables stretch the length of the west wall. Henrik builds coffins and keeps his carpenter's tools in this room. Area N6D, the kitchen. 
This kitchen contains a square table surrounded by chairs and shelves of provisions. Henrik prepares his meals here. Area N6E, Henrik's bedroom. This modest bedchamber holds a cot and several well-made pieces of furniture, including a table, a padded chair, a bookshelf and a wardrobe. Henrik sleeps here at night and well into the morning. The bookshelf contains a handful of storybooks and carpenter's manuals that have been handed down from previous generations. The wardrobe in the southeast corner has a secret compartment at its base that requires a successful DC-15 wisdom perception check in order to find. Inside the compartment are two sacks, a large one containing the bones of St. Andrew and a small one containing 30 silver pieces and 12 electrum pieces. All the coins bear the visage profile of Strad von Zarovich. Area N6F, the Vampire Nest. This large drafty room is strung with cobwebs and takes up the most of the upper floor. Stacks of wooden planks lie amid several crates marked junk. The two southernmost crates contain old junk that Henrik had accumulated over the years. The six crates in the northern part of the room are packed with earth and serve as a resting place for the six vampire spawn that lair here. If one of the characters opens one of the occupied crates, all of the vampire spawn bursts forth and attack. This location is worth noting, as it is one of the destinations that a character may be accidentally teleported to should they trigger the teleporting trap in Castle Ravenloft. They appear in Area T listed on this map. Area N7, Brinsky's Toys. This cramped shop has a dark entrance portico, above which hangs a wooden sign shaped like a rocking horse with a B engraved on both sides. Flanking the entrance are two arch lead frame windows. Through a dirty glass, you can see a jumbled display of toys and hanging placards bearing the slogan, It's no fun, it's no Blinksky. Valakai's toy maker, Gadolf Blinksky, chaotic good male human commoner, calls himself the Wizard of Tiny Wonders. But he has been consumed by despair lately because no one seems to like him or want his toys. This fascination for eerie playthings causes most other locals to avoid him. The Burgomaster enables Blinsky to stay in business by giving him a couple of gold pieces a month to make festival decorations. Blinsky is a heavyset man who wears a moth-eaten jester's cap during store hours, more out of habit than to humour visitors. In the past six months, the only paying customer who has set foot in the store is a visitor from a faraway land named Rictavio, who came in two weeks ago and bought a stuffed Vistana doll. Realizing that the toy maker was lonely, Rictavio gave Blinksky his pet monkey, Piccolo. You can use the baboon step block from the monster manual to represent him. Overjoyed, Blinsky has begun training the monkey to fetch toys from hard-to-reach shelves. The toy maker has also fitted Piccolo with a custom tailored ballerina tutu. When meeting new customers, Blinsky recites a well rehearsed greeting. Welcome, friends, to the house of Blinsky, where happiness and smiles can be bought at bargain prices. Perhaps you know of a little child in need of joy, a little toy for a girl or boy. Blinsky believes the Burgomaster is right, and that the only way to escape from Barovia is to make everyone in a town happy. Blinsky would like to do his part by making sure that all the children in Barovia have fun toys. On display are a few of his creations. A headless doll that comes with a sack of attachable heads, including one with its eyes and mouth stitched shut. Nine copper pieces. A miniature gallows complete with a trap door and a weighted hangman. Nine copper pieces. A set of wooden nesting dolls. The smaller each one gets, the older it gets, until the innermost doll is a mummified corpse. 9 copper pieces. A wooden string mobile of hanging bats with flapping wings. 9 copper pieces. A wind-up musical merry-go-round with figures of snarling wolves chasing children in place of prancing horses. 9 silver pieces. A ventriloquist dummy that looks like Strad von Zarevich. 9 silver pieces. A doll that looks remarkably like Irina Koliana? Uh, it's not for sale. Blinsky makes special dolls for the Burgomaster's henchmen, Izek Strazny. Izek doesn't pay for the dolls, but instead threatens to burn down Blinsky's shop unless the toy maker delivers a new doll every month. Every doll is modeled on a description given to Blinsky by Izek, and each doll has been closer to capturing Irina's likeness than the last. 
Blinsky doesn't know that the doll is meant to be modelled after anyone in particular. If Irina is with the party, however, Blinsky realises that she is the inspiration for Izek's dolls. Blinsky considers himself a student of the great inventor and toy maker named Fritz von Werg. Blinsky has heard rumours that von Werg's greatest invention, a clockwork man, lies somewhere in Castle Ravenloft. If the characters seem intent on going there, Blinsky asks if they could be so kind as to find the clockwork masterpiece and deliver it to him, in exchange for which Blinsky offers to make them any toy they desire. Because business has not been good, he says he has no other reward to offer except perhaps his new monkey companion. Area N8, the town square. The shops and homes that enclose the town square are decorated with limp and tattered garlands and painted wooded boxes filled with tiny dead flowers. At the north end of the square stands a row of stocks, locked in which are several men, women and children wearing crude plaster donkey heads. In the centre of the square, peasants in patchwork clothes eye you suspiciously as they use cups and vases to draw water from a crumbling stone fountain. Standing tall at the centre of the fountain is a grey statue of an impressive man facing west. All around the square are posted proclamations. Come one, come all, to the greatest celebration of the year, the Wolf's Head Jamboree. Attendance and children required. Pikes will be provided. All will be well, the Baron. The Wolf's Head Jamboree has already occurred, making the square's proclamation out of date. If the characters linger, they see the Burgomaster's henchman, Izek Strasny, arrive with two town guards. Izek orders one guard to tear down the old proclamations, while the other posters the new one. Come one, come all, to the greatest celebration of the year, the Festival of the Blazing Sun. Attendance and children required. Rain or shine. All will be well, the Baron. Most Valakians have no idea whom the statue in the square represents. The Burgomaster claims it is Boris Vakolovich, his ancestor and the town's founder, but there is no family resemblance. The townsfolk in the stocks were arrested for malicious unhappiness, spreading negative opinions about the upcoming festival. An iron padlock secures each in a set of stocks, and Izek Strasny carries a key on an iron ring. Three men, two women and two boys are trapped in the stocks, all of them tired wet and famished. The five adults have the statistics of human commoners, and the children are non-combatants. The plaster donkey heads they wear are meant to encourage ridicule. Freeing one or more of the prisoners without the Baron's consent is a crime. If the characters are witness doing so, Izek rallies the town guards, 24 in all, and order the characters to leave the town at once or suffer the consequences. If the characters stand their ground, Izek orders the guards to beat them into submission, seize their weapons, and cast them out of Valakai to be food for the wolves. If the characters are exiled from Valakai without their weapons, the Keepers of the Feather snatch up the party's belongings from under Izek's nose, and then see them safely return to the characters. If the guards fall to waylaid characters, Izek, if he's still around, flees to the Burgomaster's mansion, giving the characters the run of the town. The townsfolk lock themselves in their home, fearing that these new characters aim to murder them. Area N9, the Vistani Camp. Several footpaths and horse trails lead to this location in the woods southwest of Valakai. The woods part to reveal an expansive clearing, a small grass-covered hill with low houses built into its sides. Fog obscures the detail, but you can see that these buildings feature elegantly carved woodwork and have decorative lanterns hanging from the sculpted eaves. Atop the hill, above the fog, is a ring of barrel-topped wagons that surround a large tent with a column of smoke pouring out through the hole on top. The tent is brightly lit from within. Even at a distance, you can smell the odours of wine and horses that emanate from this central area. This natural clearing serves as a permanent campsite for the Vistani and their Dusk Elf allies. Use the following information to roleplay the Vistani and the Dusk Elves that occupy the camp. The Vistani in the camp all serve Strad. The elders have died, leaving a pair of brothers named Luvash and Aragul in charge. Both men are evil and are willing to do whatever Strad demands of them. These Vistani have two problems. First, 
Lavash's seven-year-old daughter, Arabelle, recently disappeared from the camp. Consequently, half the Vistani are out searching for her when the characters arrive. Second, the Vistani have exhausted all their supply of wine and are eager to obtain more. Characters who help them with either problem earn the Vistani's respect. The Dusk Elf race is all but forgotten, and the few survivors live in secret places such as this. They have dark skin and hair, but otherwise look similar to wood elves as described in the player's handbook. One of Strahd's old brides, Petrina Velikovna, used to live here. Her brother, Kazmir Velikov, still does. The Dusk Elves reside in small homes built into the hillside and are mostly self-sufficient. They are skilled trackers, and many of them are away from the camp when the characters arrive, helping the Vistani search for Arabelle. Strahd has tasked the Vistani with keeping an eye on the Dusk Elves, and the Dusk Elves know that they aren't safe in Barovia without the Vistani's protection. Strahd also has forbidden the Vistani from helping the Dusk Elves escape his domain. There are no women or children among the Dusk Elves. Strahd had all the female Dusk Elves put to death around four centuries ago as punishments for Petrina's murder. Thus, the remaining Elves can't procreate. A broken people. They are aware of the vampire's absolute hold over the land of Barovia. They keep a low profile and have no desire to incur Strahd's wrath again. Area N9A Casimir's Hovel If the characters approach the house at the base of the hill on the eastern perimeter of the camp, read the following. Standing quietly in front of his house, bathed in warm light of his lanterns, are three sullen grey cloaked figures their angular feature and black flowing hair, half hidden under their cowls. The cloaked figures are three guards, neutral male dusk elves. If the characters seem friendly and are looking for someone to talk to, the guards direct them inside to Kazmir or point them towards the Vistani camp on the hilltop. Kazimir Velikov Kazimir is a mutilated, grief-stricken dusk elf that has been trapped in Barovia for centuries. His people were on the verge of being annihilated by Strahd's army when they surrendered. Strahd left the few survivors to the mercy of the Vistani, who bore them into the valley of Barovia, where they have lived ever since. Kazmi's allegiance to the Vistani is so strong that he adopted the name of the Vistana who welcomed him into his clan, a man named Velikov. Although Velikov passed away more than a century ago, Kazmi continued to live among Velikov's descendants. Unfortunately, in his views, these modern Vistani are neither as noble or as enlightened as their forebearers. Not one to press the issue, Kazmir hopes to outlive the present leadership and see a return to the old ways. Kazmir's sister, Petrina Velikovna, is sealed in the catacombs below Castle Ravenloft. Convinced that she was the concubine of Devil Strahd, Kazmir and his fellow Dusk Elves stoned Petrina to death. As punishment for depriving him of his bride, Strahd butchered all the women in the Dusk Elf tribe, and Kazmi's ears were cut off for instigating the stoning. He wears a cowl to conceal this mutilation. Kazmi's feeling of loss is tinged with a simmering rage. Petrina now speaks to her brother in dreams, telling him how years of guilt and regret have dispelled all evil thoughts from her mind and cleansed her tortured soul but Kazmir remains unconvinced by her assertions, because he knows that Strahd has corrupted Petrina and led her down a path of evil and deceit. For that reason, Kazimir wants to see the vampire destroyed so that his sister can be rescued from her eternal damnation. Petrina has told Kazmir that the Amber Temple, an ancient vault hidden in the Barovia Mountains, is where Strahd forged his pact with the evil powers and discovered how to become a vampire. Kazimir has been spying on the temple for years, but he needs adventurers to help him survive its perils. He thinks that the secret of breaking Strahd's pact and freeing Barovia from its curse might be hidden there, but more important, he believes that the Amber Temple holds the secret to bringing back the ancient dead to life. With the character's help, Kazimir thinks he might be able to find out how to restore Petrina to flesh and blood whereupon he can travel to Castle Ravenloft and end his sister's torment. Casimir has no inkling that Petrina is using him for exactly that purpose, 
and that her ultimate goal is to become as powerful as the vampire Strahd. Casimir uses the mage stat block from the monster manual in addition to the following adjustments. Casimir's alignment is neutral. He has dark vision out to 60 feet. He has the Fey Ancestry feature, which means he has advantage on saves against being charmed and magic can't put him to sleep. Casimir wears a ring of warmth and carries a spell book. Casimir's traits include his ideal, I failed my people and my sister, and now I must atone or be damned. His bond is, I seek to return my long dead sister Petrina to life, even at the cost of my own life. His flaw is, I believe my sister can be redeemed. His home is a hovel with a decorated vestibule and a comfortable living room beyond with a fireplace. Wooden statuettes of elven deities stand in cubby holes along one wall. A tapestry of a forest hangs on the opposite wall. Casimir confesses that he is burdened by dreams sent by his dead sister, Petrina Velikovna whose spirit has languished in the catacombs below Castle Ravenloft for centuries. Casimir believes that Petrina has repented for her many sins, and yearns not only to be free, but also to restore her to life. If the characters seem intent on destroying Strahd, Casimir tells them about the Amber Temple. Without divulging too much about the dream sent to him by Petrina, Casimir informs the characters that the secret to breaking Strahd's pact and freeing Barovia from its curse might be hidden there. Casimir doesn't know whether this claim is true or not, but he states it as a way of persuading the characters to accompany him to the temple. His main objective, he says, is to find something there he can use to bring Petrina back from the dead. Casimir wears a ring of warmth and has a leather-bound spellbook containing all the spells he has prepared plus the following spells. Arcane Lock, Comprehend Languages, Old Person, Identify, Locate Object, Non-Detection, Polymorph, Protection from Evil and Good, Ray of Frost, and Wall of Stone. If players have a fortune of Ravenloft, the Six of Coins, the Beggar, then they will be able to find one of the treasures here in Casimir's possession. He hands it over to them if they promise that they'll help him with the Amber Temple. Area 9NB, the Dusk Elf Hollows. Six simple houses ring the base of the hill, three protruding from the north side and three from the south side. A grim, grey cloaked figure stands in front of the door of this house. The cloaked figure is a guard, a neutral male Dusk Elf. If the characters appear friendly and are looking for someone to talk to, the guard directs them to Casimir's hovel, under no circumstance does the guard willingly allow strangers to enter the house he protects. Each hovel is configured similarly to Casimir's hovel. All are currently unoccupied, except for the nine guards left behind to watch the homes. The Dusk Elves are all out searching for Arabel. Area N9C, the Vistani Tent. Piled outside the wagons are several empty casks of wine. From inside the tent comes a crack of whips, followed by the howls of young men. Three sputtering campfires fill the tent with smoke, and through the haze you see six Vestani passed out in various places on the dead grass. A barely conscious, shirtless teenager hugs a central tent pole. His wrists are bound to the pole, and his back is streaked with blood. An older, larger man in studded leather armor lashes the young man with a horsewhip, causing him to scream again. Standing in the bigger man's shadow is a third man, also clad in studded leather armor. Easy, brother, he says with a whip-wielding brute. I think Alexi has learned his lesson. The two men in studded leather armor are the leaders of the Vastani camp. The brothers, Luvash, a chaotic evil human bandit captain, and Aragul, a neutral evil male human assassin. If you use the plea for help adventure hook from the Valakai Inn, the characters may have already met Aragul. Luvash in this situation is so drunk that he has disadvantage on any attack rolls and ability checks he makes. Each brother carries a key that unlocks one of the padlocks in the treasure wagon in area N9I. Luvash is punishing a Vistana named Alexi, a chaotic neutral male human bandit with three hit points remaining, for failing to keep a watchful eye on his daughter. The character's arrival distracts Luvash and he forgets about Alexi long enough to play the role of host, 
until such time as the characters become tiresome or threatening. Alexei blames himself for not watching the little brat more closely and has accepted his punishment. If the characters try to rescue him, he screams at them to stop, not wanting to appear weak in front of Lavash and Aragul. In addition to Lavash, Aragul and Alexei, there are six intoxicated Vistani, chaotic neutral male and female human bandits lying unconscious in the tent. A drunk Vistana only wakes up if they take damage. Luvash is unhappy because his seven-year-old daughter, Arabelle, has vanished. She's been gone for little more than a day. Because everyone in the camp was drunk and Aragul was away, no one remembers seeing or hearing anything strange. Luvash is determined to find her, no matter what the cost, and most of his camp are out scouring the woods when the characters arrive. Missing from the camp are 12 bandits. Each hour that passes, 1d4 of them return to the camp, with no news on Arabelle's whereabouts. If an alarm is sounded, nine sober Vistani bandits, neutral evil male and female humans, emerge from three of the surrounding wagons in area N9G, and arrive at the tent with weapons drawn in two rounds. Luvash won't meddle in the character's affairs without Strahd's consent, and he is quite content to let the vampire deal with them. For a hefty price, he offers to sell the characters potions that allow safe passage through the deadly fog that surrounds the valley. He keeps them in the treasure wagon in area N9I. The potions, of course, don't work. If the characters rescue Arabelle from Lake Zarovich, and they see her safely return to the camp, Luvash is overjoyed and offers to repay the favour. He doesn't sell them the fake potions, and instead lets them choose a treasure from the Vistani treasure wagon in area N9I. If the characters ask something of the Vistani and have not earned Luvash's goodwill, he agrees to do business with them if they complete one of two tasks, either find his missing daughter or procure six barrels of wine and bring them to the camp. Luvash suggests that they can get wine in Balakai, or go straight to the source in the Wizard of Wine's winery. He isn't picky about where it comes from or the quality of the wine. Aragul is a much more dangerous creature than his brute of a brother. If the characters have something in their possession that is either useful or harmful to Strahd, and Aragul becomes aware of it, he tries to deprive the characters of this item, stalking them if necessary, and going so far as to kill one or more of them if he thinks he can escape with the item in his possession. If he succeeds, he takes one of the riding horses in area N9D and delivers the item to Strahd at Castle Ravenloft. Area N9D, the horses. The hilltop is covered with steaming piles of horse dung. More than two dozen horses are tethered to stone blocks inside the circle of wagons, but outside the tent. Most of the animals are draft horses, but a few of them are riding horses equipped with saddles. 24 draft horses and 6 riding horses are tethered here. Area N9E, Lovash's wagon. This barrel top wagon is nicer than the others. Drapes of golden silk hang from the windows. The wheels have gold sun-shaped hubcaps. An iron chimney pipe protrudes from the roof. Lovash's wagon is a mess inside. Empty wine skins, dirty clothes and mangy furs are strewn about. A small hammock is strung across the width of the wagon under the driver's seat that serves as Arabelle's bed. A burlap doll with button eyes lies in the hammock. Arabelle has no other possessions. A small iron stove in the middle of the wagon keeps the interior warm. The wagon's Golden Sun hubcaps are worth 125 gold pieces each, totaling 500 gold pieces. Area N9F the wagon of the sleeping Vistani. There are four of these wagons in the camp. You can hear heavy snores from within this barrel-topped wagon. Each of these wagons contains 1d4 intoxicated and unconscious Vistani, chaotic neutral male and female human bandits. These Vistani wake up if their wagon is shaken or if they take any damage. Area N9G, the wagon of gambling Vistani. There are three of these wagons at the camp. Loud voices and laughter spill from this barrel-topped wagon. Each of these wagons contain three Vistani, chaotic neutral female and male human bandits, 
the Vestani are playing a dice game for wine and favours, since they have no money. They respond to the sounds of alarm by drawing their weapons and heading to the tent in Area N9C. Area N9H, the Vestani family wagon. There are three of these wagons in the camp. This barrel top wagon is filled with the raucous screams of laughing children. Each of these wagons contain one Vistani adult and 1d4 plus 1 Vistani children. The adult is watching the children play games and teaching the children about their heritage or telling a scary story to frighten the children. Area N9I, the Vistani treasure wagon. Two iron padlocks secure the door of this barrel topped wagon. The Vistani keep all of their treasure in this wagon. The door to the wagon has two locks each of which require a different key. Luvash carries one key, and Aragor the other. Each lock contains a poison needle trap that functions the same way as previously described. The wagon contains the following items. A wooden chest containing 1,200 electrum pieces, each with the visage of Strad. An iron chest containing 650 gold pieces an onyx jewelry box with a gold filigree worth 250 gold pieces, containing 6 pieces of cheap jewelry worth 50 gold pieces each, and a potion of poison in an unlabeled crystal vial worth 100 gold pieces, a wooden throne with a gold inlay and decorative stones worth 750 gold pieces, a rolled up 10 foot square rug with an exquisite corn motif worth 750 gold pieces, a small wooden box containing 12 fake potions in stoppered goods. These Vistani sell these non-magical elixirs to native strangers, claiming that they protect against the deadly fog surrounding Borovia. Players who have the fortune of Ravenloft, the Eight of Coins, the tax collector, can find a treasure within the Vistani treasure wagon. The following are special events that can occur while the characters are staying at Valakai depending if they spend enough time or perform certain tasks. The Festival of the Blazing Sun The Festival of the Blazing Sun takes place three days after the characters first arrive in Valakai. You can delay the festival if the characters get waylaid or drawn elsewhere, or you can advance the timeline if the characters seem to be in a hurry. Under threatening skies, a parade of unhappy children dressed as flowers trudge through the muddy streets leading the way for a group of sorry-looking men and women, carrying a ten-foot diameter wicker ball. The burgomaster and his smiling wife, who holds a sad bouquet of wilting flowers, follows the procession on horseback. As weary spectators watch from their stoops, the ball is borne into the town square. There, it is hoisted and hung from a fifteen-foot high wooden scaffold, and the townsfolk take turns splashing it with oil. Before the wicker sun can be set ablaze, the skies tears open with a thunderous downpour. All will be well, cries the burgomaster as he brandishes a sputtering torch and marches defiantly through the range towards the wicker ball, only to have his torch go out as he thrusts it into the sphere. A singular laugh erupts from the crowd, drawing the burgomaster's fiery gaze as well as gasps from the town folk. The laugh comes from Lars Jules a lawful good male human guard, a member of the town militia. The other guards are aghast at Lars ill-timed outburst. The burgomaster immediately has Lars arrested for spite. Unless the characters intervene, Lars is bound by the ankles and wrists and dragged behind the burgomaster's house for the amusement of all. The burgomaster rides the horse himself. If the characters challenge the burgomaster in any way, he orders them to be banished from Valakai. If they protest, he orders the guards to arrest them, deprive them of their weapons, and force them out of Valakai at sword point. If the characters lose their weapons, the keepers of the feather from Area N2 eventually steal back the weapons and return them to the characters. If the guards fail in their duty, the burgomaster retreats to his mansion and the townsfolk flee to their homes, giving the characters free reign of the town. Tiger Tiger Karl and Nikolai Wachter, in area N2 and N4, are young foolish men of a proud noble family. The drunken brothers sneak into Aristec's stockyard in area N5, while everyone else is attending to the festival in the town square. On a dare, one of them rocks the wagon. 
the saber-toothed tiger locked inside becomes enraged and smashes through the wagon door. The characters and everyone else in the town hears the scream of the young men as the tiger escapes. The tiger flees the stockyard without harming the watchers and begins to prowl the streets looking for an escape. Reports of a tiger on the loose in the street ruin the festival and send the town folks scurrying for their homes. The saber-toothed tiger doesn't harm anyone until it takes damage, whereupon it attacks any perceived source of the damage. If he is still alive, his ex Strasny gathers six town guards and hunts the beast with the intention of killing it. Meanwhile, Rictavio does his best to lure the beast back to his wagon while assuring the town folk that it won't harm them. If he is still in power, the Burgomaster conducts an investigation to find out where the tiger came from. Guards and local witnesses are questioned. The Watchtower boys feign their innocence, insisting that they were at the festival. But Gunther and Yelna Arasect in Area N5 admit to hearing evil growls and scratching coming from the inside of the carnival wagon parked in their stockyard. When pressed, the Arasects admit to seeing the wagon's weird owner routinely drop food into the wagon through a hatch on the roof. They confess that the half-elf paid them for their silence. After the Burgomaster learns that the tiger belongs to Rictavio, he commands his guards to arrest the mysterious bard. If Rictavio thinks the characters can help him, he asks them to distract the Burgomaster and the guards while he gathers his horses, wagons and tiger in that order. If the character asks Rictavio where he plans to go, he tells them about an old tower to the west where he can lie low. Lady Watchtower's Wish Ernest Lanark, in Area N4, begins shadowing the characters. The character with the highest passive perception notices him doing so. If they confront him, he claims that he keeps a watchful eye on all strangers and doesn't mention the name of his employer. If the characters threaten him, he backs off and reports to Lady Watchter after he believes he's not being watched or pursued. Lady Watchter is looking for powerful allies to help oust the Burgomaster. If Ernest tells her that he thinks the characters fit the bill, Lady Watchter has Ernest or her sons invite the characters to a private dinner at the Watchter house. During the dinner, Lady Watchter determines whether the characters have the ability and the resolve to crush the Baron. If the characters refuse her invitation, or they profess to be enemies of Strahd, Lady Watchter marks them as her enemies and sets out to destroy them without incriminating herself. Once she determines that the characters are her enemy, Lady Watchter hands Ernest a bag of a hundred gold pieces, taken from Area N4Q, and instructs him to deliver it to the Vistani camp outside of town in Area N9, along with a letter that asks for the Vistani to dispose of the characters once they have left town. The Vistani burn the letter after reading it, as per Lady Watcher's request. If the characters have rescued Arabelle, the Vistani return Lady Watcher's gold to Ernest and do nothing. Otherwise, the Vistana bandit watches the road east of Valakai and reports back to the camp if the characters are sighted leaving. The Vistani, worried that the characters might be more than a match for them, send one emissary on horseback to race ahead of the characters and inform Strahd. If Aragel is alive, he makes the ride himself. Otherwise, the rider is a young Vistana bandit named Alexi. St. Andrew's Feast The characters can prevent this special event from occurring by returning the bones of St. Andrew to the church in Area N1, or by destroying the vampire spawn hiding in the coffin maker's shop in Area N6. If the characters stay in Valakai for three days or more, and don't retrieve the bones or destroy the vampire spawn, Strahd visits the coffin maker's shop the following evening and orchestrates an attack on the church. The vampire spawn begin by attacking the church that night. They cling to the outer walls of the roof of St. Andrew's Church, while four swarms of bats enter the church through the belfry and terrify the congregation. As the town folks flee the church, the vampire spawn leap down and attack them. During the chaos, Strahd enters the church in bat form, then reverts to a vampire form and attacks Father Lucian. Unless the other characters intervene, Strahd kills the priest before returning to Castle Ravenloft. If Father Lucian dies, locals bury his body in the church cemetery, whereupon it rises the following night as a vampire spawn under Strahd's control. If Rictavio in Area N2 
learns of the priest's death, he suggests that the characters burn the priest's body so that it doesn't rise from the dead. The attacks on St. Andrew's Church terrorize and demoralize the town. After a few days, fear turns into misdirected rage as the town folk blame the burgomaster. Baron Vakolovich's all will be well mantra can't protect him from their wrath. Barring intervention by the characters, the burgomaster's mansion is set ablaze and the Baron and his wife and his sons are dragged to the town square, thrown into stocks and stoned to death. If he is alive, Izek Strasny flees the town to avoid a similar fate. Where he hides exactly is up to you, but it is likely that he may end up in Old Bone Grinder, Argen Vosthalt, or the ruins of Berez. If, however, the characters thwart the attack on the church and protect Father Lucian, Strad pays a visit to the Wachterhaus in Area N4 and there composes a letter which he asks Lady Watcher to deliver to the characters. The letter is written in Strahd's hand and extends an invitation for the characters to come to Castle Ravenloft. Lady Watcher orders her spy, Ernest Lenark, or one of her sons to take the letter to the characters. If the characters open it and read it, show the players Strahd's invitation, and when they travel to Ravenloft Castle, they face no encounters. My friends... Know that it is I that have brought you to this land, my own, and know that I alone can release you from it. I bid you to dine at my castle so that we can meet in civilized surroundings. Your passage here will be a safe one. I await your arrival. Your host, Strad von Zarevich. Strad's machinations run deep within the town of Valakai. If you have any hope of defeating him, you'd best keep your wits about you and beware who you trust. Strahd's goal is to make everyone within his domain bend to his will and to snuff out any noble spirits he finds. He enjoys creating divisions and seeing others struggle with loss as it feeds his own lacking character. A person to whom everything is owed and more. As he is a vampiric undead, he cannot raise a family only create more blood-sucking spawn. To this end, he seeks to find a living replacement for himself. But the moment he finds anyone worthy of his family's name, he immediately is filled with spite and bitter envy, as all he can see is a reflection of Sergi and a reminder of his parents' disappointment with what he has become. There is still more to Barovia, and Strahd's cruelty that you will uncover.